This meeting has been convened to consider the Regulated Professions Health and Social Care Amendment Bill 2019. The purpose of the bill is to amend the five health regulatory acts, the Dentist Act of, 2000, uh, of 1985, the Health and Social Care Professional Act of 2005, the Pharmacy Act of 2007, the Medical Practitioner Act of 2007 and the Nurses and Midwife Act of 2011 and to give further effect to the EU Directive on the Recognition of Professional Qualifications. I would like to uh, welcome the Minister, uh, Minister of State for, in, at the Department of Health with special responsibility for mental health and older people, Mr Jim Daly, and his special officials to the meeting this morning. We will now go directly to the Bill and Section 1. Uh, the question is that Section 1 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? It is agreed. Can I just ask a procedural issue, Chair? There's, there's one issue I want to discuss that isn't really contained in, a, in an individual section. Can I just ask your advice on when the time to discuss that with the Minister is? Well, if you could broadly outline where you want to come in and we'll yeah. allow you in when it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, and can I just acknowledge the... Um, Minister's decision not to uh, not to run again. I think uh, the next doll will be will be one good person down. Um, if uh, if he had indeed been re-elected, um, so I know it can be very difficult. But I want to acknowledge. I think the minister is a is a fine parliamentarian and has done a, an exemplary job. And has done himself, his family, uh, his party, and his constituents very proud in uh, in his work. And he will be he will be missed. I also note the minister looks about ten years younger than the last time I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, wait! The world is uh, is uh, is coming coming off. Okay. Uh, but I do. I just want to acknowledge the minister's fine work over many years uh, here uh, in in Parliament. Uh, minister, we can get into it whenever you want, and maybe you or your officials would like a bit of time to prepare for it. it it's really a question around the Brexit proofing of the legislation and what may happen. Obviously, this is around recognition of qualifications. It exists within an EU framework. And we have Brexit coming, which potentially causes all sorts of problems. So, at, whenever is the right moment in the bill, time to do that. I'd like to just get your thoughts on: Is the bill Brexit-proofed, uh, and and how are we going to deal with? We have a, a, a lot of excellent healthcare professionals here who've been trained in the UK. They may be Irish citizens who trained and have come back, but they or they may be UK citizens. Um, but they hold UK qualifications recognised here, or in some cases maybe not recognised here. Um, Post-Brexit, what is the thinking on uh, their status here? And indeed, for our healthcare, we probably doesn't, probably isn't within this bill, but if it is relevant, uh, the, the, if there is any um, reciprocity with the UK in any of this, does it have any impact on uh, healthcare professionals uh, registered or qualified here who are, who are working in the UK? Yeah. yeah, I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, we, we will be discussing that issue again uh, at 11 o'clock when we have officials in, in relation to Brexit in particular. And I'll give you a few lines on that as well before I complete uh, the, the thing today. So the question is then that Section 1 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, section 2, there are uh, uh, amendments. The, uh, amendment number 1 in the name of the Minister. Uh, amendments 1. 22, 24 to 26 inclusive and 28 are related and will be discussed together. So, uh, Amendment 1, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Gormal, uh, Chair, and thank you for the, the welcome and indeed thank the Deputy for his, his very nice uh, welcoming comments uh, there as well, which are very much appreciated. And I will come back to the Brexit question uh, at the first opportunity there uh, in a while. Uh, yes, uh, these amendments will bring CORA's fitness practice process into line with those operated by the other health regulators, the Medical Council. The MBI, PSI and Dental Council operate a two-stage fitness to practice sanction process wherein the fitness to practice committee may recommend a sanction to Council with Council making the ultimate decision as to the sanction of CORU or an, an exception as their legislation currently requires that Council also seek recommendation from a professions registration board before determining what sanction should be applied. The Council is not required to accept this recommendation. This additional step generates a significant cost to an administrative burden on the regulator and has been subject to criticism by the President of the High Court. This additional step also creates an additional financial and emotional burden on the registrant during what is typically an extremely challenging period in their life. These amendments will remove the requirement for Council to refer all sanctioned recommendations by the Fitness Practice Committee to the Registration Boards. It should be noted that a representative of each of the designated professions sit in Corus Council. I also wish to signal that a further amendment will be required at report stage to delete the recommendation making function of the Registration Boards contained in Section 27 of the Act. 
Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, any comments on that? No. The question is then that <coughs> section one stand. Uh, sorry, section two um, as amended stand part of the bill. No, continue. I'm just stressing that they're all taken together. Yeah, you're aware of that, Chair. Yeah, that I'm taking uh, 1, 2, 24, 25, 26, and 28 together. Are there any comments in relation to the, the other sections? No. So the question then is that uh, Section 2, as amended, stand part of the bill? Agreed. Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. That's Section 3, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That's section 4, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That's section 5, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That's Section 6, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. That's section 7, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. In relation to Section 8, there are two amendments, uh, Amendment 2 and Amendment 3, in the name of the Minister. Amendment 2 and 3 are related and will be discussed together. Uh, so, uh, Minister. Right. Uh, thank you, Cahir. Section 8 of the Bill inserts a number of new sections into the Dentist Act 85, which relate to recognition of qualifications for entry to the register and registration. The Bill's draft, Section 26B, sets out the means by which the Dental Council can recognise a qualification for registration. Section 26B1D, to which these amendments relate, concerns the recognition of qualifications which are neither an Irish qualification or a qualification automatically recognised under the Professional Qualifications Directive. In the event of a no-deal Brexit, with which uh, Deputy Donnelly was querying, this will apply to UK qualifications. Section 27 of the Dentist Act has been repealed, and the Bill's proposed text in 26B10D replicates text from Section 27.2D of that Act. However, on review, it was considered that the text could be made clearer. The amendment to the Bill makes clear that the Dental Council may approve courses of training and exams already undertaken to allow for registration, as well as specify in reals exams set by the Dental Council which applicants must take past the show equivalents in order to achieve registration. This makes clear the legal base for any mutual recognition agreement which the Dental Council might make with a third country, and obviously that again will apply to Deputy Donnelly's. Uh, query, the new text replicates text being inserted into the Medical Practitioners Act 2007 by virtue of Section 83 of the Bill. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Deputy Donnelly. Minister, can I just ask on, um, on Amendment 3, yeah. where it says, has a qualification in dentistry from a state other than this state and has passed an examination specified in rules made for the purpose of this paragraph. Um, in, in medicine, there have been concerns raised um, to me pretty consistently when it comes to doctors, that in some cases the... Um, the examination the state, the, the bar that the, the state is setting is not adequate. Um, and that in some cases we are taking in doctors who, maybe through no fault of their own, um, simply are not trained to the level that our doctors are required to be trained to. Um, I have no idea if uh, that is the case in dentistry, but can I just ask, this, this amendment goes to the heart of the check so if we're taking in dentists from um, other states, my understanding is that within the EU, the qualifications are simply recognised. You, you might just, first of all, confirm that, that if it's an EU dentist, is there anything or do we simply accept that they are fully qualified? Um, and for non-EU dentists, or indeed for EU dentists, if we don't automatically recognise it, what safeguards are in place to make sure that the bar um, is adequately set so that the dentists who are coming in from other states do have the, the, the same level of rigour and, and training that we demand of our, our own dentists trained here. So, yeah, Deputy, the first part of your question so is, is there a difference within the e, uh, EU and outside the EU? Yes, but within the EU, there's a, a standard um, recognition across the way. So people from across the EU are recognised in each of the EU countries automatically. And so just on that, Minister, do they have to then... So if a dentist comes from any EU country, are they asked to pass any additional examinations? Or are they put through oral examinations? Is there any additional testing? Or is, it, or is it simply assumed that they are the same as a dentist coming out of a dentistry school in Ireland? Oh, yeah, yeah um, 
sometimes there may be just language skills and there may be a test on language skills, but from a qualification, I think from the, the essence of your query is it is accepted across the EU that there's a standardised uh, that's, you know, met in all EU yeah. countries and they all adhere to the same standards. So there's a, an acceptance recognition across, uh, between EU countries other than language qualifications, okay. which will apply obviously in some countries that, um, uh, and then outside the EU, uh, the Medical Council will have to satisfy themselves that any applicant coming in from outside the EU is appropriately qualified. That may take part in, you know, or take process by way of an examination or by way of some, um, I suppose, research into their background or whatever, but does the Medical Council will have responsibility in that line. Okay. So there isn't an automatic acceptance for outside the EU. Are there any countries, I know in medicine there's a, it feels to me like quite a, quite a random group that we do accept, including there's one African country, one Asian country, and that's right, there's a, an odd group, I think, that also, it's EU plus a, a, a handful. Mm -hmm. um, do we have the same for dentistry, or is it once you're outside the EU, you have to pass the medical council tests? Yeah, so my understanding is, um, uh, Deputy, that uh, say, with, in particular, you asked on dentistry, uh, there is a number of agreements with some countries, like, say, you know, an accepted agreement, say, with Canada, for example, you know, where there would be a particular large supply coming from um, some other countries, then there would have to be, a, a, um, I suppose, a, a check to see that the standards are the same, or an exam to make sure that the standards are the very same, their standards are the same as ours. Mm. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Deputy Durkin. Similar line. Um, I'm not quite certain, uh, but um, I've dealt with a number of cases of uh, professionals in 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 in, in uh, the health and associated areas, and the same different standards seem to apply at times. For example, a number of people have got through and have been appointed to positions, uh, doctors, for example, uh, for which they weren't qualified at all, and we only found out about it afterwards. And whatever system is in place, um, it's not working. But it works extremely well in veterinary medicine because they block everything. <laughs> Nothing gets through. And even the smallest technical detail, qualifications make no difference. They have to sit the exams again all, all over here. Now, I know it's a restrictive practice. I know why it's there too, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> but in, 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 in the human health area, we need to be that bit more alert, and we need to have the, the, to, to whatever standard applies. If they, <coughs> if they apply to what the European, the highest European standards, we have to aspire to that. I don't agree with the notion that we should test everybody again and have a, a, our own separate test like we have in in, in, in the medicines area. But uh, uh, we do need to apply fairly rigorous uh, uh, application of the rules. If we don't, uh, we are undermining the quality and standard of, the, of the, the health services, be it from whatever branch it comes. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Uh, any other contributions? No. So the question is then, um, is uh, Amendment 2 uh, agreed? Agreed? Agreed. And the question is, is Amendment 3 agreed? Agreed. agreed. So can we then accept that um, section eight of the sorry section eight of the bill as amended uh, is agreed it stands part of the bill agreed, agreed. Uh, the question is that section nine stand part of the bill agreed uh, that section 10 stand part of the bill agreed that section 11 stand part of the bill agreed. Uh, in relation to section 12 there are four amendments in the name of the minister Four to eleven uh, oh, yeah, yeah. inclusive will be discussed together. Fourteen, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen, twenty thirty three, thirty four, thirty seven, thirty eight, forty four, forty six, fifty, fifty one and fifty three are related and will be discussed together. So Minister on amendment number four. Okay, Grand Margaret Eka here looking again as you outline 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 14, 15, 17, 18, 33, 34, 37, 38, 44, 46, 50, 51 and 53 
Uh, I propose to take them together, with the exception of Amendment 18, which corrects a typographical error in Section 25 of the Health and Social Care Professions Act 2005. The rest of these amendments correct typographical or minor drafting errors in the Bill. These amendments should address all, the errors, all of the errors, but in the event that more discovered or consequential amendments are required as a result of committee stage amendments, it may be necessary to introduce further correcting amendments at report stage. Um, Deputy O'Reilly. Yeah, um, Minister, this provides for uh, a failure to make a, a declaration that that will be treated in the same manner as uh, practitioners prohibited or restricted from providing care. Did you consider anything maybe a little bit less onerous for the, the failure just to make a declaration that, that it, it does seem a bit unduly heavy? Can you just clarify the, the point? You're saying that... The the on, you mean the onus on the, the registrant? Is yeah. that the onus on the registrant? Yeah. yeah. What specific section, uh, Deputy, can you just... I don't have it here in my notes, it, just under section 12. Um, as I said, we've had some dialogue with representative bodies and it, it, it's, it was them that brought that, this to our attention, that it seemed onerous on the basis that if you fail to make a declaration that it, you know, that it, it is a little bit harsh that you would be Okay, that off. seems like a substantial query on the, on the, I suppose, on the nature of the bill as opposed to these, this particular amendment is only just correcting typos, literally. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate typos. that. No, no, I'm speaking so, just to the section yeah, rather yeah. than the this Maybe I could amendments. come to that at the end, um, if that's okay Fair with enough. the deputy. Yeah. If we can just move through the procedural side of it and if you want to raise some substantive issues like that, we can have a discussion there. That's no bother, um, thank you. If that's okay with the deputy. Deputy Donnelly. Chair, I, similar to Deputy O'Reilly, I, I have a question on Section 15, and the grouping of amendments we have now is the only amendment in Section 15. So I can ask it now, or I can wait till we come to Section 15. Wait. So the question then is that um, Amendment 4 be agreed? Agreed. Uh, uh, and that Section 12, as amended, stand part of the bill? Agreed. In relation to section 13, uh, there are three amendments, five, six and seven in the name of the Minister. Uh, five already discussed with four, six already discussed with four and seven already discussed with four. The question is that uh, amendment five be agreed. 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 Uh, and the question is that number uh, amendment number six be agreed. Agreed. And that amendment number seven be agreed? Agreed. The question is then that section 13, as amended, stand part of the bill? Agreed. Is that agreed? Section 14, there is one amendment, amendment number eight, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with uh, amendment four. The question is that uh, amendment eight be agreed? Agreed. And then the question is that section 14, as amended, stand part of the bill? That's is that agreed? agreed? Uh, section 15, uh, one amendment, amendment number nine in the name of the Minister, already discussed with uh, amendment four. The question is that amendment nine be agreed? That's agreed. agreed. And then that section 15, as amended, stand part of the bill? Oh, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, Minister, I think the, the new right for healthcare professionals to be able to appeal minor sanctions is, is very welcome. It was certainly a peculiar situation where they could have a finding made against them with no, no uh, recourse to appeal. So I think that is welcome. I, I am concerned that the legislation and Section 15 sets the High Court as the, as the place for them to go, including, I believe, for quite minor sanctions. The High Court is um, very intimidating for many people, <laughs> including myself. Um, it can be vastly expensive. Um, and the idea that a healthcare professional who may have a legitimate grievance on a, on a sanction against them would have to go to the High Court, um, it seems over the top to me. Certainly healthcare professionals have raised the issue. I know some of the representative bodies have raised the issue that a, uh, the various healthcare professionals in here would have to uh, engage solicitors, they'd have to engage barristers, um, and, and, and also in terms of the workings of the courts, 
obviously the high courts are dealing with it, a, an awful lot of things and, and, and can have um, quite serious backlogs. I just wonder, is the high court the right place to go, A, as a reasonable path for somebody who's appealing what can be a very minor sanction, and B, for the courts in terms of the severity of some of the things they deal with, is that the right thing for the courts to be doing? But my focus really is on the healthcare professionals themselves. Um, I raised this at second stage. Uh, I, I was hoping there might be a, a government amendment to that effect. Could, could you just explain why such a high bar is being set for the appeal against what could be quite a minor sanction, when minor sanctions in, in other areas, be they for driving offences or drug offences or whatever it is, can be dealt with in, in, in lower courts. Thank you, uh, Deputy Donnelly. And Deputy O'Reilly? Um, Chair, thank you. I think, uh, I, I don't know if I'm unique in this stall, but I'm certain, I think I'm unique in this room and that I would have dealt with uh, the outworkings of this legislation. The appeal to the High Court is really, really, really onerous um, and for the time that it takes, for the stress that it causes. But also, um, let, let's you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that it costs a fortune. It costs a state a fortune. I know, I mean, I, I've, I've been, I've been in the High Court uh, on, on an appeal when I was given leave to represent a, a member myself. Um, and they, they really, they, they turn up with a full team. It's, uh, it, it's really, really, uh, I would say for the state, a very expensive process. But obviously the, the High Court is there as, as an option, but for relatively minor, um, you know, matters. It is the only avenue sometimes, and you know, it is extremely intimidating, number one, but it also does cost a huge amount of money. And I mean, you know, like from the, the, the perspective of a healthcare professional, they're paying their retention fee in order that the organisation that they're paying their retention fee to can spend a huge amount of money taking them and their colleagues to, to the High Court. Not for serious matters, everybody appreciates that, but for relatively minor matters, it does seem, uh, it does seem a little bit a little bit heavy, uh, you know, and it is very intimidatory. I do, and as well as that, you've got the time factor, because let's be fair, the courts probably have more onerous things to deal with, um, and you have that time factor, you have that hanging over you for the whole time. We're, we're dealing with processes with the best will in the world can take years, and they do, the whole process, it, it does have a huge, huge impact on people's lives. It's, it's not like nobody goes into these professions to have to deal with a legal profession and it's something that, that can really hang over them. And even when, you know, in the case where the appeal is successful, you're still talking about a lot of time, effort, energy and money being, being expended in the intervening time. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you, Deputy. They make very reasonable points and it is something, of course, that would be obvious and unreadiate at why the High Court. I suppose the one issue that just to put focus on uh, is that it's not the sanction that's appealed it's the actual finding, you know, which is different. Yeah, while we refer there uh, a number of times to a minor sanction, it's actually it's the finding, the finding, which is on your professional conduct, which is a very serious, you know, it's on your fitness to practice. It can impugn your good name, you know, your, your professional good name or whatever. So that brings the level of seriousness. That's notwithstanding your concerns about the, the person's ability to access the High Court, the cost of the High Court and all of that. So I'm not diminishing that, but I just mm -hmm. want to put that focus on to give a bit of context to it. Um, so that's why the High Court is, is, is included. Uh, on the costs, yes, I suppose there's two sides to the cost argument as well. You know, this is about trying to find a balance between the patient and the registrant. You know, about protecting the integrity of the healthcare system and the delivery of services to the patient and ensuring that their rights are there and that we have the, the strictest and toughest of, uh, you know, standards met at all levels. Um, but, of course, if you do go to the High Court, I mean, in some cases it will be, the costs will be awarded. Uh, to the employer or whatever, you know, if, if you're right, if you have been wronged by your employer, the, the cost would be awarded, you would expect, I mean, that I can't preach all travel happen, an outcome there. And also you would have unions, of course, would be taking a lot of these cases and would be anticipated. But the main trust of what I'm trying to say is that it is essentially about the finding that has been challenged, which isn't never minor. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a minor finding when it is fitness to practice and impugning your character and your professional reputation, as opposed to the, the sanction, you know, the focus wouldn't be on the sanction. Thank you, Minister. And Deputy Durkin? Yeah. Chairman, I have in two minds about this one. Um, I have been in the High Court on numerous occasions, I have to admit, for my various sins over the years. Not in a personal way, but uh, uh, I think that, yes, if, if there's, the, if there's a, a professional issue raised against a, a, a practitioner, 
I think it is a serious matter. I think we need to guard against it. We're very careful. We need to be careful what we do. I'm not certain whether the High Court should be the first uh, 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 um, instance court. Uh, it may well be possible uh, to have the matter dealt with at a lower court, uh, in a circuit court, for example, with, option, uh, with options for both sides to refer to the High Court, obviously. But uh, it can be intimidating, yes. But at the same time, um, I have to say that from my experience, I found the judges at the High Court level to be very, very cautious in the way they delivered and very careful to ensure that the rights of the individual were at all times observed. So I would, I would have to say that in, 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 in this context in particular. Maybe to a greater extent than you would find at some of the lower courts. And I've been in all of them as well, Mr. Chairman. Just for, 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 to put everybody in my, everybody's mind at ease. My, well, my understanding is that uh, a decision of the Medical Council has the status of the High Court, and the High Court is the only court that you can make an appeal to. Uh, I, like it goes back again to your good name as a professional practitioner, and that is, a, you know, that is integral to anybody, and to protect that. The, you know, it is deemed appropriate that they, the, an office such as the High Court should be the, the appropriate office if your good name has been challenged uh, by your employer. So it, it is essentially still focusing on the registrant. It is essentially keeping there in mind, but that right is a, is a very significant right. And, and just acknowledge the learnedness of the, the speakers opposite. They have quite a, an experience of the, of the court system that I wasn't aware. So well done to you. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to try, you have to try and hand it over to the chairman. <laughs> So, can we put the, the question then? Oh, sorry, Deputy Donnelly. Um, Minister, I, I, what, I, what I'd like to know is why, why not a lower court and, and was it looked at? Um, I've dealt with, we've probably all dealt with cases um, where healthcare professionals have had their lives destroyed by the HSE. Some cases, and I've dealt with more than one case where it was done intentionally and vindictively and wrongly. And um, I've seen good people who had done nothing wrong. In fact, some people who, had, who were what we would now class as whistleblowers, destroyed by management within the HSC. Um, I've seen them had to leave work. I've, had to, I, I've seen them leave the country. I've seen people sitting in high court wondering if the judge was going to award them costs because if they didn't, they were going to lose their house. So telling anyone that they have to go to the High Court to clear a minor sanction is an extraordinarily onerous thing to do. It can cost them their, their mental health, it can cost them their physical health, it can cost them their reputation, it can cost them their house, it can destroy them financially. Just to go, it's an, it's an exceptionally high bar to be the first place that somebody can go. And maybe if it is a major decision, maybe if it is a decision that a, that a medical practitioner is unfit to practice, then maybe in that case the High Court is, is the only place they can go. But my understanding of the legislation is that this is for minor sanctions as well. So if your entire professional reputation is, is, is up for grabs, and if you have a decision made that you are not fit for practice, then, then maybe the High Court is the place to go. As Deputy Durkin said, Mm -hmm. you, have, you have very Focus skilled and experienced terms, yeah. judges there, okay? My question is on minor sanctions, because the reality is, for nurses and doctors and dentists, um, some of them will have the wrong decision made. Even with the best will in the world, the wrong decision will be made, bad information will be used. Um, and as I say, I've seen, and I'd say most members of this House have seen cases where the HSC has intentionally moved to destroy good people for vindictive, petty and bad reasons. And if the only safeguard these people have is the High Court, they're stuffed. I don't believe it is reasonable for someone to have to go to the High Court and put everything on the line, their family home potentially on the line, over a minor sanction. So can I ask two questions? Were other um, less onerous mechanisms looked at for minor sanctions. And if they weren't looked at, 
will you give an undertaking to the committee that before this comes back for report stage, and maybe we could have an informal meeting with yourself or Minister Harris, the officials and, 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 the, and the committee, could you come back and, and assure us that you have looked at everything else, ideally come up with a better solution? Because I just don't believe it is reasonable, because we all know what will actually happen. What will actually happen is when, there are, when, when wrong decisions are made, as they are made sometimes with the very best will in the world and the best motivations, there's no way people are going to go to the High Court. There's no way they're going to risk their family home and everything that's involved in taking a High Court action against the state, because as Deputy Durkin says, the state uses it as a tool. You walk in with whatever solicitor and barrister you can afford. The state doesn't. The state walks in with an army of lawyers. Um, it's not a fair fight. And so can I ask that, first of all, why for minor sanctions? Has every other option been exhausted? And, and if it hasn't been exhausted, can we please look at this um, before this legislation comes back for report stage? Yeah. Oh, uh, Sorry, very briefly, um, on, on the issue, and, and I understand that when the, 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 the council sit, they sit and, and, and with, the, with the power of the High Court, and I can see why it has to be a kind of a like for like, but, but you've, you've heard the concerns that are being raised. If there is to be an informal meeting, which I actually think would be very, would very, be very helpful, I would suggest that we, we might ask someone who has been through that experience, so from either the representative bodies or the legal profession, who might be able to speak to how it happens. It's a very long, drawn-out process. I, I, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but I have been, been through this, uh, th this process on rather more occasions than I would have liked. So it might be that, that somebody outside, with, I'm talking about really practical hands-on experience, not somebody who's going to take us through the legalities of it, but I think you can hear the concerns that we have. It is very daunting. They do, the state does go, um, I'm, I'm, it's not mob-handed, that's the wrong word, but they bring a big, big team. I mean, I remember standing in the, uh, in the, in the foyer at the court, and my, my poor members looking at me going, okay, I have you and they all came in a big bus and there's millions of them and it's extremely expensive and it's really intimidating for the for the person who's doing it bearing in mind this person has already been through the ringer and uh, been through the processes you know and, and and it is you know it's quite a harsh process and then at the end of that they're they're facing into it it's it's really it, you know, I think you've heard what we're saying, but just if we are going to organise a meeting, and I do think I, I would support that, I think it would be useful. I think we should just bring someone in who has a bit of practical experience that might be able to speak to us about that. Okay. Can, Minister? Can I assure the members that uh, there's no problem if you want any clarity uh, between our report stage, of course, mm -hmm. and, and the officials will be happy to, to sit down and have further examination of this. But there's a lot of precedence that informs these kind of decisions, which is the existing judicial system that exists in Ireland today. You know, so if you're caught for a misdemeanor, a road traffic act, you go to the district court. If it's something more serious and, and a higher level, then you go to the circuit court. And if it's of such a, a standing, it's the high court is the appropriate. So this is following that kind of legal precedence that's there. And again, I have to just, um, I suppose, uh, comment on Deputy Donnelly's uh, repeated use of, of minor sanction. It isn't a sanction. You can't appeal the sanction. You appeal the finding. The sanction, the, the High Court is not going to say, look, this was here for three months is wrong. They should have got two months only. They won't do that. They will just say that this was an impugning of their professional conduct or their character, and that is the most serious impugning that any of us can have in our fitness to practice on a daily basis. So it's, it's recognising the seriousness of the finding is what has um, dictated the seriousness of this particular and where it should be and the most appropriate forum to deal with it. And that's why it's not to make it difficult for the registrant to access justice. I mean, they can always go in their own individual rights to any court on the day, but I mean, there is an accepted, um, you know, uh, I suppose, journey that people take legally depending on the, the viciousness of the wrong that is done to them. Yeah. And of course, I accept that there's costs involved, but costs are awarded in, in, in accordance with the legal system and all of that. This is not designed to make it difficult for the registrant to access justice. I can absolutely assure you this is just in recognition and respect of the existing judicial norms that are uh, um, in the state. But if the, if the deputies opposite would like a briefing, a further briefing, and to, you know, to get further clarity on this, of course, there is absolutely no problem there. We'll, we'll arrange that further. Deputy Donnelly. Uh, thanks, Minister. Yeah, to be clear, I'm, I'm not looking for further clarity. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a better answer. Right, um, and I, I accept your point on the, it, it, it's a semantic point. I, I, I know you, you, 
you're, you're, you're not trying to play with words. Yes, when I say minor sanction, let's say a minor finding, right? Because you can have a finding where the medical council says this person has been, has, has acted with gross misconduct and has been negligent and we believe this has endangered the lives of his or her patients. That's the kind of finding one might take to the High Court. But there's going to be every single finding below that, that they may not have paid due attention for a particular period of time. They may have failed to follow a WHO protocol before operating theatre that had no effect on a patient, but actually they should have followed the WHO protocol. There is a myriad, um, and some are fairly minor findings. But the other thing this legislation does is it says every single finding against a healthcare professional will now have to be made public. And so this is serious, because for anyone running a practice, um, you know, people will be able to look up findings made against them, and that transparency is welcome. But it puts an awful lot of weight on the findings, because a member of the public, when they're looking at a dentist or a doctor or uh, at whatever service, they may just see, well, this person has three findings made against them, or two findings made against them by the medical council. I'm not going near this person. Whereas, in fact, those findings may be pretty, pretty minor, right? Now, so, so, so for, the, for the medical pro professional, this is very, very serious. For a GP, for example, this is very, very serious. And you, you, you said in your, in your response, Minister, that the, the medical practitioner can go to any court. They, they can't. They can go to the high court. That's the, that's the point. They can't go to any court. That's the whole point of this. The only place they can go under Section 15 is the Court of Appeal or the High Court. That's it. Um, so I'm not looking for a briefing on clarity as to why that's the case. What, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, and, and sorry, just before I get to the question, I, I, I don't accept the argument that this is the existing judicial norm. The existing norm is we have several layers of courts, four or five layers of courts, depending on where you put the Court of Appeal. And broadly, the severity of the situation warrants a higher court. But that's not the case here. There's only one court, and it's the second highest court in the land. Um, and it's not accessible to most people. So I, I'm not looking for more clarity. What I'm asking is, why were other solutions not looked at. For example, um, an independent appeal board linked to um, the Medical Council, right? How about a non-judicial appeal first, right? That could have been looked at. I don't see why that couldn't, couldn't happen. Um, and I'm sure there's a myriad of other non-judicial or quasi-judicial uh, solutions that could have been looked at. And maybe if the Medical Council find against you and then you have a professional non-judicial appeal board that also upholds the medical council, well then maybe the circuit and the district court simply aren't equipped to deal with findings against a person's name and actually th there's simply no choice. But this is binary. The medical council finds that you didn't follow the correct WHO protocols and whilst no patients were put at risk, you should have followed them. Okay. Um, your only option is to go to the High Court. So my, my ask is not for clarity on the decision made. It's, I, I don't feel, and it feels to me that, that the, the committee, I don't speak for anybody else, but it, 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 this doesn't feel appropriate. Will you undertake between now and committee stage to find a better solution? And that's the briefing that I'd like to have, rather than just to have this e explained in more detail. Mm -hmm. Deputy Sorry, yeah. Is it the case um, that it's to the High Court because it's a like for like, so you can't, you can't, you couldn't appeal to a lesser court, so it's it's the one to the other. Okay, so I, I think that, that that was getting lost in the in the discussion there. So it has to, of necessity, be to a forum similar to the High Court uh, or at a similar level. In that regard, it doesn't necessarily have to be the High Court. And I suppose what what we would be looking for would be. Uh, some kind of, and again, we are talking about situations where the the finding, the the, the, the issue under discussion may 
B, so like some of them are a lot more serious than others, Minister. You, you know that you can see it, okay? And it isn't fair that they would be treated the same, and it isn't fair that they would all have to go to the High Court, so that there would be some sort of stopping off point. I appreciate it can't be to a lesser court on the basis that it has to be like for like, and that's fair. But there, there has to be something else. It's, it's really, really scary for the people who have to do it. So if we can, um, you know, maybe come back and have that discussion <coughs> on the basis of what we've just, <coughs> we've just discussed here, because I think you, you, you can understand the, the, the point that we're trying to make is, is okay. okay. Sure, thanks. Deputy Riley, thank you. Deputy Durkin. Yeah, I, look, uh, we, we, we do aspire to keeping the highest standards, and we have to do that. That's, that's the, an obligation that, that, that on all of us. In, in respect of all professions, but some differ. And we live in a different, we live in a changing world now, where there can be false allegations, spurious allegations, and quite an amount of accumulated evidence, false evidence, to back these things up, because modern technology makes that possible anymore. So. We, we need to, to weigh that against the need to, to, to that possibility of, of, and at the same time, the need to achieve the highest possible standards. And at the same time, to give the individual in the eye of the storm their constitutional rights and entitlements. And that is a serious issue if there should become about, for whatever reason, a situation whereby somebody gets banished into exterior darkness. Uh, for, for, for what may not be a sin of that nature. And it has kind of serious professional, and, and different professions deal differently with these things. Some professions uh, allow a situation, a wither on the vine situation, to prevail for months and years, and the professional in, in the eye of the storm has no future. And they're afraid, because they're afraid of the extent to which they may have to involve themselves in the costs of going to the higher courts and so on. So there is an issue there, Mr Chairman, that I think we need to just keep a close eye on. And if at all possible, to make some kind of provision whereby uh, the individual's rights are, are not ignored. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Uh, <coughs> Minister? Uh, okay. Um, again, thank you, uh, members opposite, for the for the contributions. Look, uh, you know, I, I do think it, this could be dealt with better in a, in a, in a form, maybe uh, less formal. But I will uh, attempt one more time to just uh, stress. First of all, to answer Deputy Donnelly's question that I may not have answered earlier, uh, were other options considered? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. There's no question of that. Uh, there is existing legislation there already that we're also, which this is amending existing legislation. So with this, and you know, there is existing legislation. We have to have an eye to. And that's where I bring the thing about precedence. Uh, I, I don't want to trivialise it, and I don't want these words to be construed in any other way, but like, we, are, we can have the impression here that we're treating the, a parking ticket the same as a drink driving offence, right? There is already an existing threshold to access the medical council. This is about fitness to practice. So, like, you know, somebody you know, arrested for a parking ticket or a violation of the parking ticket rule, and I'm, I'm not trivialising what I've talked about, I'm just trying to be helpful here, uh, is, first of all, cannot access, if it's a parking ticket issue, if it's of that um, level, it, you cannot access the Medical Council Fitness for Practice Tribunal. They won't. There is a threshold to be reached there before it will be entertained. So, while somebody referred there to kind of vexatious and even social media and the things like that, that's not going to, to launch into one of uh, medic, uh, fitness for practice. So fitness to practice is an extremely, and this is about recognising the seriousness of that accusation, that you are not fit to practice for whatever the, the, the reason is. So it's, it's in line with that seriousness that the High Court is the appropriate uh, already as well. There also is in this, I mean, first of all, we're introducing an appeal for people, this legislation, that's to be recognised that, that there wasn't there before, an appeal a process for practitioners or registrants. That's the motivation of this legislation. Uh, secondly, uh, the High Court is going to be informed of all decisions. That as, once this legislation comes into effect, the High Court will be informed of all decisions made with regard to the fitness to practice, and that's an automatic uh, notification, and they are going to review them and review the sanctions. So that's a further safeguard in it. But look, I think if uh, the members opposite I take on board what your, your frustration is with the accessibility of the High Court and the intimidatory, intimidatory you know, uh, aspect of the High Court, and that for registrants can be. But there, we have to balance that with the seriousness of the, the, the issue at stake. We have to respect existing legislation and due process and, and so on. But look, I think maybe a more informal uh, conversation around this could be helpful um, to the members opposite and I'm quite happy to arrange that. That's not in a bit to try and 
forward to not answer any of your questions. I just think that we, we, we might do it across the table uh, more, more straightforward if members are happy with that. And if members want to continue here as well, I'm, I will see, answer any further questions as, as best I can. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> so the question is uh, Amendment 9. Is Amendment 9 agreed? <coughs> agreed. Agreed. The question then is that Section 15, as amended, stand part of the Bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to six, uh, Section 16, there is one amendment, Amendment Number 10, in the name of the Minister, already discuss, discussed with uh, four. The question is that that Amendment 10 be agreed. Agreed. Uh, so the, the question is then that uh, Section 16... Oh, sorry. There is another amendment in Section 16, uh, section 16 Amendment 11, already discussed with uh, Amendment 4. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed? Agreed. agreed. And then that Section 16 as amended stand part of the Bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, in relation to Section 17, there is one amendment, Amendment Number 12, in the name of Deputy Louise O'Reilly. Uh, Deputy O'Reilly. I move. You move. Um, thank you. Oh. I don't have to speak. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I, I'll just I'll probably just illustrate this with an example, if that's all right. Um, so a couple of years ago, I represented a nurse who had been struggling with uh, addiction. Um, and during that time, she was guilty of poor professional performance. Um, but in the intervening time, this woman had worked really hard with the support of her family and everybody else. She, she got her life completely back together. Um, but she still had to go through. So she had two years in serious recovery. Uh, and I mean, working hard at recovery. And then, but she, uh, she had returned to work, not, not to nursing, but she had returned to work in, the, in a healthcare setting. And she uh, had to go, to, she, she, she had put all of that behind her. So she went through the fitness to practice. It was something that it could have been kept out of the, the, the public domain. Okay? And, and given the latitude and the leeway to the, to the um, fitness to practice committee, was really important in that regard because you could make the case and say, look at this, this person, that's not who they are anymore. Their, their life is different now. And th this woman had made huge changes to her life. Publication in that instance um, and compulsory publication or mandatory publication as, as, as is outlined here, all that that would have done would have been to bring her back to, uh, to where she was. So the, the purpose of this amendment is one, to, uh, to open up a, a dialogue um, but also to, uh, in some way, take away the, the compulsory element, or you know, that it shouldn't be mandatory, that they should be allowed to exercise um, a high level of discretion. And in particular, when you're referring to, to um, minor incidents, not necessarily minor, actually minor incidents, um, I suppose it, it, it's like I've seen the, the fact that it takes so long sometimes to come to, uh, to the committee, there's so much evidence to be gathered. People can in the intervening time, you know, sort of get back on track. And I, I felt at that stage and, and with other cases that publication serves no purpose. It doesn't serve the public interest. It serves only to, uh, to undermine uh, that woman and, and, to, and to, in that case to bring them back to, uh, to, to where... Uh, you know, to, to, to a place where she didn't, she had worked very hard to get out of. So, you know, where there is a public interest, I fully respect that that has to be done and, and that used to be the case. But in, in cases where uh, discretion can be applied, I think discretion possibly should be applied. And that, that's the purpose of this amendment. Thank you, Deputy O'Reilly. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, the Chairman. Yeah, I think we deal with the, the, the issue specifically about um, the compulsory or otherwise of publication in, in a separate section, but in, in any event, the Bill provides that regulators will have the discretion to publish or not information which they receive about health professionals uh, sanctioned in other jurisdictions. This includes notification to the HSC and an employer where known. This is particularly important given the free movement of workers across the EU arising from the Professional Qualifications Directive and the increased mobility of health professionals globally. While we must support professional mobility, we must equally protect the public from practitioners whose competence, behaviour or conduct has been found to be deficient in other jurisdictions. 
and in this instance the Deputy's Amendment would remove the regulator's ability to make such notifications about dentists who have been sanctioned in another jurisdiction and acceptance of this amendment would treat dentists differently from practitioners governed by the other four health regulatory acts. For these reasons I cannot support the amendment so it would be specifically for dentists if this amendment was to be and would exclude the others. Uh, and also we will be dealing with the whole uh, issue of publication at a future, uh, at one of the, uh, the upcoming amendments there, yeah. the, specifically the publication element. Yeah. And can I ask, Minister, just have you had dialogue with the representative body in this regard? Uh, yes, uh, Deputy is the answer. Uh, there has been discussions with, uh, with the representatives and uh, there is, and it is due to come up in the future. Um, it probably will be more, more appropriate in future. In other words, when we get up further in this meeting, yeah. we'll be dealing specifically with that and I can address it in if that's, if that's okay no, with that. No, that's fair enough, yeah. No, no, no. If you're okay with that, yeah. Thank you. Chair. So, uh, Deputy O'Reilly, is the amendment being pressed? Uh, Chair, I will move and withdraw this amendment and I, I may read it. Thank you. So the question then is that section 17 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? It's agreed. In relation to section 18, uh, there is an amendment, uh, amendment number 13 in the name of the Minister, uh, 13, 27, 31, 32, 42 and 52 are related and will be discussed together. So uh, Minister, in relation to amendment 13. Yeah, uh, the five acts currently provide that information on non-minor sanctions is made known to the Minister, to the HSE and to employers where they are known to the regulator. The Bill provides for two key changes. It removes the requirement to notify the Minister. While it is important that the HSE and employers receive information about sanctions against their employees, it is not necessary for the Minister to receive this information, particularly as the acts provide for no function associated with receipt of it. On the other hand, patients do need to know that they are in safe hands when they entrust their public health or their health to a doctor or to another healthcare professional. And the public needs to have confidence in the role of the regulator to address deficiencies in competence, behaviour or standards through a transparent system of mandatory publication of sanctions. Accordingly, the Bill also provides that information on all sanctions will be made known to the HSC and to employers where they are known and to the public. This is an important patient safety measure widely supported at second stage, which will ensure that information relating to sanctions imposed on registered health professionals is placed in the public domain. Accordingly, the Bill provides that all disciplinary sanctions imposed by the five health regulators will be published once confirmed by the High Court. While I understand concerns raised that the publication of all sanctions may negatively affect registrants, this must be balanced against the public's right to important information about the fitness of a health professional to provide them with safe health care. However, I have considered the concerns raised by stakeholders outside of this forum, and in balancing these concerns with the public interest, I have decided to amend the bill to provide for mandatory publication of all sanctions unless publication is inconsistent with the decision of the High Court. Deputies will be aware that when holding confirmation of sanction hearings, the High Court in specific circumstances can order reporting restrictions or can hold hearings in camera. These amendments will provide for those circumstances where it is shown to the court's satisfaction that there are compelling reasons against publication, for example, when dealing with vulnerable registrants. I trust this approach, which is supported by the regulators, will address the deputies' concerns in relation to sections 36, 59, 117 and 160. Thank you, Minister. Deputy O'Reilly. Well, Chair, I've already outlined um, the reasons why I will no be concern. opposing that. I'm, I am I'm deeply concerned. I think that the, not that anything should be kept from the public where it is in the public interest, but it has to be absolutely balanced with the impact that publication has on a person's life. And you have to consider that these things take a lot with the best will and the fastest process in the world. These things still take a long time, and the, by the time it comes to publication, you're, you're dealing with issues that happened uh, previously. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I do think 
we need to insert the maximum compassion and balance that, obviously, with the, with the public interest. I suppose, Deputy, as, as outlined probably in what I said there anyway, but uh, like there is scope here now as a result of, of the concerns you have raised to um, leave it to the discretion of the High Court or to leave it to be like it's only at that stage that the decision to publish can happen anyway, further to the High Court. And at that stage, there is a facility here for the High Court to say, yes, I agree or I accept that there are um, extraneous circumstances or extraordinary circumstances or whatever unusual circumstances that this should not be published. Now, okay. they're my words, not the... the no, the, no, and I appreciate that, but, uh, Minister, in, in my experience, um, that discretion is seldom, if ever, I think, uh, if ever uh, exercised. And I think... Uh, I want to be very, very careful. The, uh, we absolutely must protect the public interest and where it is in the public interest to publish. I think that erring on the side of we will we will publish unless there is i think that they they need to to have that discretion and if the appeal then if i'm hearing you correctly the appeal would be in the event that the the regulatory body or the fitness to practice committee uh decided to publish that the appeal would then be to the to the high court to request that that pub, that, that it wasn't published am I, am I wrong in that is that am I all decisions you? have to be notified to the high court anyway and it's only at that stage then the publication can be you know can happen or and there is an opportunity at that stage for an appeal to be made not to publish yeah but again you're you're back at the high court and you're back in that you know one little individual versus you know i'm i'm you know but versus what, a massive what team. What we have to decide is who would make the, who who would who would decide whether it should be published or not. Who would you be proposing should make the decision of whether it should be published or not? Well, I mean, the regulatory body could decide if it was in the the public interest and make a recommendation on that basis. Um, and I think the the way that it's worded, and uh, again, the, the the purpose of this is is to tease it out. If I'm reading it wrong, I'm I, I'm, no, no, I'm perfectly willing to be uh, corrected on that. But the way that, that it's published, and the, the, what, what I hear from it is that you'll always publish unless there's a substantial reason not to, whereas I, I think you might weigh it the other way around. And I, I say so on the basis that I've, it does take such a long time. It, it is so very onerous for people. And it feels like if you're, if you're talking to somebody who's gone through this process, it feels like it's never going to be over and it never leaves them. I mean, I... I I know from dealing with them, like I'd be in the happy position that I could go home after meeting them or after one of the sessions. I could go home, and it's it's not it's not my life, but it's every single day, and it never goes, no matter what they're doing. Even in the back of your mind, even when when they know, and all they can think about then is no matter what happens, it they still have another hurdle to go, and it can still come back at them. And you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't protect the public interest and that we shouldn't uh, publish where where there is good reason to do so. But I think it should be the emphasis. It should start from the point of they won't publish unless it's in the public interest to so do, in which case they will. I, I just think it's, it's a difference of, of emphasis. I suppose the difficulty we would, we would face here collectively is putting it into legislation, how we would word this particular, you know, like not to publish unless it's <coughs> in the public interest. Uh, and when you legislate, as you know, there's no, there's no room for, for, like what we're talking about is, is extra ordinary, you know, special circumstances where there are legitimate reasons not to publish. And all of us accept that, there, that they exist. And I think mm -hmm. that's the point you're trying to bring, and you have succeeded in, in bringing to our attention and getting recognised here that, yes, there are exceptions, you know, exceptional circumstances where it exists that publication is not in the best interest. They're rare. We would maintain and that they are the, the, not the norm. They are the exception, but they exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the question arises, like, we can put it into here, into legislation, that you don't publish unless you're absolutely sure it's right or whatever, but that's restricting the, the whole objective of this, which is to give patients as well the right to know if somebody has a history that is not, um, you know, yeah. there. So we have to try and get balance that, those yeah. rights of the patient to know and the registrant's particular extraneous circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we do that? How do we balance those best? And who makes the judgment call? Now, you spoke there about the regulator could make the case. And, of course, the regulator, as I understand it, I understand to be correct, can the regulator could make the case to the High Court ahead of publication under this as exists? that, look, we, we understand this case very well and we believe it would not be in the interest, but ultimately the determination has to be made by somebody mm -hmm. and that would have to be. So in other words, the registrant themselves may not even have to make the case to the High Court. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the regulator could say, having dealt with this, we actually wouldn't be recommending publication 
and, and that happens. So, yeah. you know, so there, there still is there, but the determination is who is really the crucial point, who determines finally. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the courts, I suppose we have to accept as a democracy, are the, the overall superseding um, mm -hmm. authority when it comes to those, to, to making determinations. Yeah. Can I just ask a question? As, is, as things currently stand, and I'm familiar with one of the, the regulatory bodies, but is it the case for all of the, the regulators that a minor, um, so a censure rather than a striking off or an admonishment, or whatever, is that automatically notified to the High Court in all cases, mm -hmm. currently? At the moment, deputy, but once the bill goes through, <coughs> there will be. But you see, that's my point. So in the case where it's not notified to the uh, at the end of a, a, a hearing, mm -hmm. you go back for your confirmatory hearing, so you're sent the result. And I'm, I'm, I'm working off my memory, and I only have experience of one, and it, it has changed somewhat. So, but, but my recollection is you, you get your result, you go back in for your confirmation, and you then make the case at that stage where it's minor, so you're not going to go to the High Court with that. that doesn't need the, the, the approval of the High Court. So you bring, go in, you bring the person with you, and you say, look, this person's got their life back together, or this was one minor incident that happened four years ago and exemplary records since then or whatever and that you can make the case directly to um, people some of whom are, are from the same profession and that you can say look I, I don't believe the public interest is served by publishing this now you can, that, that step is removed and I'm not talking about for serious uh, um, things where, where the person's been struck off at and very different but I'm talking about for censure or, or admonishment or, or something a minor, it not, may not be minor to the person that happened to, I don't be you, trying to reduce the, the, the language, but in that instance, that now goes, that, that's now funneled automatically into, the, the, per this legislation, that goes automatically to the High Court, and it's up to the High Court then to decide about publication, but surely at the lower level, where you're sitting in a room with the committee, that you could say, look, we, you know, here's our reasons why, or this person's reason why they don't believe it's in the public interest to publish that. Whereas once it goes to the High Court, you're, you're into that adversarial somewhat process already, expensive process, almost definitely. I think we can all agree on that. Quite intimidatory and scary, and then time as well. So you're, you're still talking about a long time, and it never gets to be over for the person. And I, I just don't understand why, in the case of a, a, a lesser um, incident that, uh, or, or series of incidents, or whatever, that, that you would have to go to the High Court. That seems like a big change, and it seems like one that is not necessarily in the public interest, because I don't believe it's in the public interest to always have these uh, these cases published, although I do fully accept that, yes. you know, that there, there, there are absolutely cases where it is in the public interest. But if, if that's a big change if the if, if it's if it's going to go through and it's an extra layer for for people and i think it, it's, it's you quite must remember the point i made earlier about the threshold to actually get to fitness to practice to sit and investigate you know i don't think that we're not in the in the territory of minor incidents as this is somebody's fitness to practice being questioned and that can't happen and can't be entertained by the medical council unless it's a, of, deemed by them to be of such a serious nature before any of this kicks in into the next phase where so going back to my analogy of a parking ticket and drink driving you know parking tickets won't enter this process because they won't get through the first stage of it anyway and again it's about as much the registrants right because of their fitness to practice is being is being um is being challenged Minister, i really, really do wish i had your confidence that, that that things that are not appropriate won't get through the net <coughs> they, they they will and they do um, and that's no fault of any one person, but it happens. And the potential exists within this to absolutely um, wreck a person's life. Uh, I, I have serious concerns about this. Thank you, uh, Deputy O'Reilly. So, uh, yeah, I, I just a final point, just, you know, again, like, what is the objective of these? It's one to protect on one level, protect the public, protect the registrant, trying to balance those <laughs> rights. And I suppose essentially what all of this legislation is about, trying to build confidence in people, in the, the function of the regulators, because that's what people don't have the confidence sometimes in. And the whole, I suppose, right to publish uh, is, is essential to that, to have an open and transparent and fully, you know, accessible um, and accountable uh, and credible 
uh, system of regulation and part of that is, is, the, is, the, is the right to publish unless it's deemed not, whereas if you come at it from the other side, not the right to publish unless it's deemed, well then you're taking away that element of transparency, which is essential, I believe, into the underpinning of the, the faith in the system for all of us of the regulators authority. But for the, for the admonishment or censure, uh, that, that is new. That, that's a new departure. So they, they wouldn't normally, uh, they, they don't currently go to the High Court, but they will now go to the High Court, uh, I, I believe, because the, the, there's, there's three sets of people in this. So there's the regulator, there's the general public, and then there's the registrant. And the, the, the rights and entitlements of all, I think, have to be balanced. And I, I don't think that this is being fair to, to one of the yeah. people in that side. I, I suppose the so difficulty... I, yeah, I don't want to labour the No, you're OK. And look, the Deputy, I absolutely, absolutely so respect your back... No, no, your background, your background in this. You know, I absolutely regard your background and your frontline experience in this. And, you know, I want to put that on the record uh, and not have it just as a given. Uh, so I, I am listening intently to, to the points we're making uh, and, you know, will we'll do my best to explain back the other way. But again, you see, we can unpick this bit by bit, you know, if we take it in a, in a sectoral or in a, in a silo-like approach to one aspect of it. But like if you stand back and look at the system in its entirety, going back to the system of the threshold to access the fitness to practice, then the fitness to practice and the sanction have to be fed to the High Court anyway mm -hmm. and has to be approved by the High Court before there's any talk of publication. So you've come to that stage anyway, you know, we've come to three or four steps. So we can't look at it in isolation from the original misdemeanor to the stage of being publication. And that is all steps necessary in the process, which we deem really and collectively. I would imagine we all want to ensure that the regulator has the full powers and is open to accountability and scrutiny. And, you know, publishing is part of that so that there isn't anything. Um, but we accept that not everything runs like clockwork. And there you, you certainly have brought that to this legislation, that there are circumstances where it is legitimately in the overall better interest of the person not to have it published. And we've recognised that by, through this legislation, by affording the High Court the right to dictate that it would not be published. And the process to do that is, can be done through the regulator, can be done you know, by the person to the regulator at the time of, of, um, of the investigation. Thank you, Minister. So, uh, following that discussion then, uh, in relation to Amendment 13, uh, the question is, is that amendment agreed? Agreed. Not agreed. Not agreed. So the question then in relation to Amendment 13, the question is that the amendment be agreed. All those in favour uh, say to. To. And those against? Neil. I think the question is carried. The question then is that um, Section 18 as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Read. In relation to section 19, uh, amendment number 14, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with number 4, the question is that that amendment be agreed? It's agreed. That section uh, 19, as amended, stand part of the bill? Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, that section 20, stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to amend, uh, section 21, there is one amendment, amendment number 15, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with four. The question is that that amendment be agreed? Agreed. Uh, the question then is that section 1, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, section 22, amendment number 16, in the name of the Minister, 16, 29, 45 and 54 are related and will be discussed together. Uh, amendment number 16, Minister. Colonel Margaret Cahir, look, regulators are increasingly switching to electronic or internet-based registration systems. The provisions for notification and the bill require prepaid post. These amendments are designed to give the regulators the option to issue notifications about registration by email or other electronic means. These amendments provide a degree of future-proofing and will ensure that efficient and cost-effective registration systems can be introduced. These amendments are required in the legislation relating to the Medical Council, Nursing Midwifery Board, CORU and the Dental Council. It is not necessary to amend the Pharmacy Act. The Department is currently 
currently consulting with the regulators in relation to notification of other events outside of registration, and it is possible that I will seek to introduce some further amendments at the report stage in that regard. Come on. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed? <coughs> agreed. Agreed. The question then is that Section 22 is amended stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. <coughs> Uh, section 23, the question is that Section 23 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. <clears throat> in relation to Section 24, there's one amendment, Amendment Number 17, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with Amendment 4. The question is that Amendment 17 stand part of the bill? It's agreed. agreed. Oh, sorry, that, section, that Amendment 17 be agreed? Agreed. agreed. And then that Section 24 as amended stand part of the bill? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, in relation to section 25, there are a number of amendments, 18, 19, 20 and 21, in the name of the Minister. They re refer to new sections. So in relation to amendment number 18, it has already been discussed with amendment 4. The question is that this amendment uh, be made. That's agreed. 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 Uh, in relation to Amendment 19, in the name of the Minister, again, insertion of a new section. Uh, 19 and 20 are related and will be discussed together. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, yeah, these proposed new section, sections to the Bill amend Section 31 and Section 38 of the Health and Social Care Professionals Act 2005. Section 38 of the Act sets out the circumstances under which a registration board shall grant registration. Section 38 of inserted by means of an amendment to the Act in 2017 relates specifically to the Physiotherapist Registration Board. It allows persons who graduated from the Institute of Physical Therapy and Applied Science after the 1st of January 2013 to register with the Physiotherapist Registration Board until 31st of December 2019. This amendment will remove the ample that the specific qualifications referred to must have been awarded after the 1st of January 2013. This is to enable a small number of qualified professionals who return to the state after practising in another jurisdiction who had spent a number of years out of practice to register with the Registration Board. The amendment will also extend the time allowed for such applicants to make an application under this section of the Act by two years to the 31st of December 2021. The amendment to Section 31 is a consequential amendment and provides for the deletion of the reference uh, to the date of the 1st of January 2013. Um, Deputy Donnelly. Thanks. Uh, Minister, they, this, um, this raises the issue of, 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 of non-specialists going on to the specialist register. There's a few different places it's touched on in the bill. It's touched on in Section 86 as well. And so I might just address the totality of that, if I, if, if I may. Um, there's a very serious issue in Ireland where um, non-specialists are working in specialist posts. Um, in layperson's language, non-consultants are working as consultants. Um, they, in some cases, haven't got the requisite training, they haven't got the requisite qualifications, and the patients have absolutely no idea that the person they're seeing isn't a consultant. And we've discussed it at committee before. My own view is that if it is found in the future that there are, that there is negligence um, from any of these people, I, I I think there could be some very serious consequences, obviously in the first instance for the patients, but also for the state. I think anyone who's going in to see a consultant, having at this stage waited maybe two or three years to see them, um, needs to know whether in fact the person they're meeting is a consultant or, or, or not a consultant. Um, since I've been on this committee, it's been raised several times and the number actually is going up. We, I've submitted various PQs, and, 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 and the number the last time I looked, I think, was about 168, but I'm, I'm open to correction on that. My fear is that this bill provides more ways for doctors who are not specialists, who have not qualified as specialists, um, to now be on the specialist register. So rather than us coming back to it in, in various sections where various sections talk about it if, if you're if, if you're willing to could we could we discuss it in totality now um, it may be the case that it, this has been very carefully thought through and that anyone who is not a specialist and is coming on the specialist register there's what you've just outlined is a two-year time frame there's another part where there's a one-year time frame I think for a different group of doctors who aren't in the specialist register um, 
can you can you just walk us through exactly what types of doctors who are not specialists could end up on the specialist register? I interrupt the chair for a second, just for one, just with, with, with a view to be expedient. For the, uh, we will, it's, it's Amendment 39 and 40 specifically deal with that. Yeah. And this is 19 and 20, which is just for CORO, which is just for physiotherapists. Oh, just, we, we have a, sorry. We have a, you're okay. We have a specific amendment regarding consultants and the specialist register, which is 39 and 40. Apologies. If, if the members are okay to wait. Uh, that was the point I was going to yeah. check. So Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Um, in, in relation to section or amendment 20, Minister? Same spoken to, yeah. yeah. 19 and, and 20 together. And 21. So the, the question then is that amendment 18 uh, be agreed? Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. The question is that amendment 19 be agreed? Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Amendment 20 be agreed? That's agreed. Is that agreed? And that amendment 21 be agreed? Is that agreed? agreed. Section, the question then is that section 25 as amended stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Uh, the question in relation to 20, section 26, the 26 stand, section 26 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, in relation to section 27, that's 27, section 27 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. And in relation to section 28, that's section 28 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to section 29, there are two amendments, Amendment 22 in the name of the Minister and Amendment 23 in the name of Deputy Louisa Riley. Amendment 22 is inserting a new section and has already been discussed with Amendment 1. And 23 is uh, 23, 30, 35 and 47 are related and will be discussed together. Um, so Minister, in relation to Amendment number 22, 22 is agreed already, I think we've spoken yeah. to that, okay. so we're on to 23 is next, if that's all right. Uh, in relation to the 23 then? Uh, the proposed amendment would introduce the word serious to the definitions of poor uh, professional performance in the Medical Practitioners Act, the Nurses and Midwives Act. Sorry, should I have left the mover go first? Yeah, yeah. Is Deputy O'Reilly okay with me to proceed? Yeah, with my, my, I think. Okay. The Notice of Midwives Act, Pharmacy Act, and the Health and Social Care Professionals Act, as deputies may be aware, this definition was considered at length by the High Court and Supreme Court following a judicial review instigated by Professor Martin Carberry. Following a finding against him by the Medical Council of Poor Professional Performance, the Supreme Court decision confirmed emphatically that a threshold of seriousness exists for all cases involving poor professional performance. The Court clarified that this threshold is provided for in the definition of poor professional performance in the Medical Practitioners Act 2007 and it follows in the other Health Professionals Regulatory Acts. I am satisfied that the judgment leaves no doubt as to the interpretation of the poor professional performance and there is no doubt amongst the regulators who apply the threshold in arriving at their decisions. I can understand that amending the definition as suggested by the deputy might appear not to do any harm. My preference is not to risk introducing unintended consequences to something that has been the subject of detailed uh, court examination on which there is now a substantial body of case law. And for that reason, I, I do not support uh, the deputy's amendment. Uh, yeah, Chair, this does arise out of the Corbally judgment and um, the, the judicial review consequent to that. Um, is the minister saying that his belief is that this legislation does legislate for the Corbally judgment? Because that's not my view. In, in my view, this legislation doesn't uh, incorporate the, uh, the, the, the Corbally judgment. Um, the court unanimously dismissed the Medical Council's appeal against the High Court's quashing of a council decision that uh, Professor Corbley should receive an admonishment over a once-off error. Uh, the court said that the law requires for a medical professional to have to undergo a public inquiry. A threshold of seriousness, which is what I, I'm seeking to try to introduce, must be met. They further said it was neither fair nor just that somebody like Professor Corbley should be subject to such an inquiry with the attendant extensive publicity that we've already talked about, some of which lack fairness and moderation. Um, but despite this, th this hasn't been legislated for um, as yet. And what my amendment is seeking to do, and uh, Minister, I'll be honest, I, I would have preferred if, uh, if a similar amendment were coming from yourself, and I'd be happy to, to support it. Um, but what I'm trying to do is to legislate across all of the primary acts to incorporate the Corbally judgment into the definitions of poor professional um, performance. Um, and Minister, this is something that uh, has been raised with me by no, a number of people, and I know uh, it, it's been raised with others. Um, I'm sure it has been raised with others on the committee. Um, and I think this is something that I, I, will, I will have to press. But... 
I suppose, uh, Deputy, from the outset, can I be very clear? I, I have no objection to your, your amendment in principle and what you're trying to achieve. I agree with you wholeheartedly and support it. The only thing I'm saying is that it's not necessary because that it's already in here. Didn't it? That's, so I just want to be clear okay. on that for you to, to show you I, I actually share your ambition and that's part and parcel of what we're doing here. I'm just relying and going back to the Supreme Court decision that said, following the Corbally uh, case, it said that where poor professional performance is, that there's a level of seriousness you know, automatically attaches to that. So it is serious by nature. So that there's no need to put the word serious in. That's the, the point I'm making. But that's, look, you know, I, I, again, I want to stress, I absolutely get where you're coming from, and we agree wholeheartedly with that side of it. It's just <coughs> that it's necessary when we, are, when we are legislators and when you are putting forward words that are going to be interpreted in the courts afterwards and, you know, whatever, you obviously take appropriate care uh, into the use of those words and how many of those words are necessary mm -hmm. to state what the intention of the legislators is at the time of legislation. And my understanding here is that it's not necessary to include the word serious because poor professional performance has already been by the Supreme Court, the highest court of land, mm -hmm. has been established as that level of seriousness. Minister, would you not agree that it does need to be incorporated, though, that the, the, the ramifications of the judgment does need to be incorporated into primary legislation? I mean, we can't leave it up to, to, to case law to, to determine this, I think, or, or precedent. And indeed, there's a salutary lesson for people in what's going on in another jurisdiction about leaving things up to precedent. But I, I'm, I don't want to make light of this, but I think it is important that the Corbally judgment be legislated for. I don't believe that it has um, been legislated for as yet across uh, primary legislation. And in the absence of it being, I mean, like it was a landmark judgment. It was recognised as such by members of the, the medical and the legal professions. Um, and I'm just wondering why it hasn't been incorporated into uh, primary legislation. I suppose it's like it's the regulator's interpretation of the threshold, you know, uh, that's what matters here. And I, my understanding is that we're satisfied that the regulators absolutely understand the seriousness, you know, because mm -hmm. of poor professional performance and that that's where it becomes an issue. But um, I mean, we could probably argue the toss all day, every day, on whether the, the, the need for the word serious has to go in there. Mm. I would argue that, you know, we're not going to be relying on case law. It's the interpretation of the regulators who will be applying this and which, uh, their understanding of it. And I don't think they're in any doubt uh, whatsoever. It's not that I don't think. I know there's no doubt uh, at that level uh, as a result of that judgment. But, <clears throat> look, you know, I, I'm not going to argue with you all day, every day. You're yeah, no, you, I couldn't. You're we actually substantially agree. So it's a very hard yeah, to argue yeah, with a person yeah. when you're agreeing with I mean, you're, you're a legislator and you're entitled to your very strong view on yeah. the interpretation. So I, I don't have a supremacy in that particular... I don't have a supremacy to you in, in, anything, <laughs> and in any regard. If, yeah, he hasn't had no, no, but like, we, we agree on this. It's only, it's only a yeah. question of the words. Yeah, how necessary yeah. is it to include the word uh, serious? Do we absolutely yeah. need... You know, my own sense of it is that it's not necessary, that, and I'm very confident of that, that it's not necessary. But... You're a legislator of equal uh, import here, so that's, mm. you know, I'm going to... Thank you. Uh, Deputy O'Reilly. So, in relation to Section 29, then, the question is that uh, Amendment 22 uh, be agreed? It's agreed. Look, there'll be agreed. a further stage of report stage if the Deputy still feels uncomfortable with it. Well, well, well that's, no, sorry. The 22 be agreed? Uh, uh, 23... But yeah, 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 we were taking not, not agreed, not agreed at this yeah, stage. No, oh, sorry, 22 no, is 22, it? yeah. 22 was already discussed, but um, Amendment yeah. 1. Yeah. So that's agreed. Is that amendment be yeah. agreed? That's agreed. Yes, thank you. And then in relation to Amendment 23, which is the one we have been discussing, um, is, is the amendment being pressed, uh, Deputy? I will move and withdraw the amendment, Chair, and uh, I will seek um, further discussions in that regard. Um, but. It, it is. It's, we've, we've agreed on this. It's, it's just a question of the words. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Deputy O'Reilly. The question then is that Section 9, 29, as amended, stands part of the bill. Well, 22 was... Yeah. That, that Section 29, as amended, stands part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to Section 30, uh, there is one amendment, uh, Amendment Number 24, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with uh, Amendment 1. The question is that uh, Amendment 24 be agreed. That's agreed. The question then is that Section 30, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to Section 31, there are two amendments, 25 and 26, both in the name of the Minister. Both involve new sections. 
They have already been discussed with Amendment 1. So the question is that 20, Amendment 25 be agreed? It's agreed. Agreed? Agreed, yeah. That uh, Amendment number 26 be agreed? It's agreed. Agreed. The question then is that Section 31, as amended, stand part of the Bill? It's agreed. That Section uh, 32 stand part of the Bill? Agreed. 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 That Section 33 stand part of the Bill? Agreed. That agreed. That Section 34 stand part of the Bill, is that agreed? It's agreed. That Section 35 stand part of the Bill, is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to Section 36, there is one amendment, Amendment Number 27, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with Amendment 13. That that amendment be agreed? Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> Deputy O'Reilly, I think you have comments to make in relation to Section 36. I do, and I oppose Section 36, but for the reasons that I have outlined uh, already in relation to Amendment uh, Number 12, uh, in as much as uh, we've had the, we've had the discussion about the uh, the effectiveness and the the impact of uh, publication, um, it, I've already outlined my concerns, uh, and I think the. To be fair, the Minister has, has heard them. Uh, my concern is to balance the rights of the regulator with the rights of the general public, with the rights of the registrant, because there are three actors in, 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 uh, in any scenario. And I, uh, I fundamentally believe that, at the moment, the system that's in place provides for an appeal at the level of the, the, the findings of an appeal at the level of the regulator uh, in relation to publication. That's going to be completely removed, and it's automatically everything. It, uh, admonishment censure is automatically now all going, always going to go to the High Court. And for all of the reasons that I've, I don't want to keep labouring the point, but for all of the reasons that I've outlined, I, I, I don't think that that is necessary. And that's not to say that I, I don't value, um, indeed, um, welcome anything that strengthens the, the public interest element of this. But I, I just don't feel I think that's unnecessary and unduly harsh on the uh, registrant. Thank you, Deputy O'Reilly. So the question then is that section 36, as amended, be st stand part of the bill? Agreed. Is that agreed? agreed. Not agreed. But, so you're, you're opposing section um, 36. 36 in its entirety? Yes, for the reasons outlined previously. So the question is that 36, as amended, stand part of the bill. Uh, those in favour say ta. Uh -oh. <coughs> those against say nil. Nil. So uh, I think that the question is carried. Is that agreed? In relation to section 37, uh, there's one amendment, uh, amendment number 28. In the name of the Minister, it's an insertion of a new section. It's already discussed with Amendment 1. The question is that Amendment 30, 28 be agreed? Agreed. The question then is that Section 37, as amended, stand part of the Bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to Section 38, there's one amendment, Amendment number 29, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with 16. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed? Agreed. Sorry, it's number... Amendment 29, 29. Be agreed. 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 The question then is that Section 38, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? It's agreed. agreed. Section 39, stand part of the bill. It's agreed. Section 40, stand part of the bill. It's agreed. Section 41, stand part of the bill. Agreed. Section 32, stand part of the bill. Agreed. agreed. Section, sorry, 42, stand part of the bill. That section 43 stand part of the bill? That's agreed. That section 44 stand part of the bill? Agreed. That section 45 stand part of the bill? Agreed. Section 46 stand part of the bill? Agreed. And that section 37 stand part of the bill? Agreed. And that section 38 stand part 48. of the bill? Sorry, 48. 48. Um, in relation to section 49, 
There is one amendment. It is amendment number 30 in the name of Deputy Louise O'Reilly. It's the insertion of a new section and has already been discussed, discussed <coughs> with amendment 23. Deputy O'Reilly. Chair, I, I, for the reasons I've outlined, I'm not going to go into them again. I think the Minister has, and, and his, his officials have heard, uh, have heard my arguments in that regard. So are you pressing that uh, amendment? I will move and withdraw the amendment, Chair. The question then is that Section 49 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. <clears throat> that Section 50 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 51 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 52 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 53 stand part of the Agreed. Bill. Agreed. That Section 54 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 55 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 56 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 57 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. That Section 58 stand part of the Bill. Agreed. In relation to Section 59, there is one amendment, Amendment Number 31, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with Amendment 13. The question is that Amendment 31 stand part of the Bill. That's agreed. Oh, sorry, is, is amended? Yeah, agreed. 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 And there is a second amendment in relation to section 59, which is amendment 32 in the name of the minister. <clears throat> Again, already discussed with um, 13. The question is that that amendment be agreed? That's agreed. And Deputy O'Reilly, you have comments. You're opposing uh, section yes, 59. Indeed, the, <laughs> the reasons already outlined, and I'm not going to go through yeah. them. I am opposing section okay. 59. So that question is in then, then that section 59, as amended, stand part of the bill. Not agreed. agreed. Not agreed. So, do you want to? Do we have? No. no, no. Okay. So the question then is on amendment um, on, on section 59 uh, that that stand part of the bill. Those in favour say to. Oh. No. Those uh, against say nil. Nil. I believe that the question is carried. Is that agreed? Agreed. In the, the question ends that, that section 59 then as amended stand part of the bill. That's agreed. That's agreed. Yeah, we've done that. Sorry. In relation to section 60, that section 60 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 61. There is one amendment, amendment number 33, in, in the name of the Minister. It has already been discussed with amendment 4. The question is that amendment agreed? agreed. It's number, what number is it? 33. Oh, 33, sorry. Yeah, okay. 33. Yeah, fine, yeah. Um, the question is then that section 61 is amended stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 62, that section 62 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 63, that section 63 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 64, there is one amendment, amendment number 34, in, re in the name of the Minister, already discussed with amendment 4. The question is that amendment agreed? Agreed. The question then is that section 64 as amended stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 65, that section 65 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 66, there is one amendment, amendment 35, in the name of Deputy Louise O'Reilly, already discussed with amendment 23. The question is that amendment 35 Or sorry, do you want to discuss? Sorry, we have, we have discussed this in in some detail. So um, my intention would be to to move this amendment to withdraw it. Um, but I do suspect that in, in the absence of uh, an argument that convinces me that you're going to legislate in primary legislation for the Corbally judgment, that I will I will be bringing it back. Okay, so uh, withdrawn. So the question then is that section 66 then part of the bill. Agreed. 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 That section 67 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That section 68 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 69 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 70 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 71 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's 
agreed. That section 72 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 73 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 74 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 75 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 76 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 77, there is one amendment, uh, amendment number 36, in the name of the minister. 36 and 41 are related and will be discussed together. Mr. Minister. Yeah, amendment 36 is consequential on amendment 41. The bill provides for the establishment of a register of adapters by the Medical Council. This is a register of doctors who are required to undergo a period of supervised practice and our academic training, which allows an applicant with mutual recognition rights under the Professional Qualifications Directive to reach the standard required for registration under the Register of Medical Practitioners. These amendments address an oversight in the bill and will ensure that doctors under the Register of Adapters are subject to Parts 7, 8 and 9 of the Medical Practitioners Act. These parts relate to complaints and the imposition of sanctions. These amendments will ensure that the full provision of the complaints process will apply to medical practitioners on the register of adapters in the same way as they do to persons on the register of interns and on the register of medical practitioners. The proposed text necessitates removal of section 95 of the bill which relates solely to interns and replacement with this new text which relates to interns and adapters. Thank you Minister. Any comments on that? Okay, the question then is that Amendment 36 be agreed? It's agreed. The question then is that Section 77 as amended stand part of the bill? That's agreed. That Section 78 stand part of the bill? That's agreed. The question is that Section 79 stand part of the bill? It's agreed. The question is that Section 80 stand part of the bill? Is that agreed? That's agreed. That Section 81 stand part of the bill? Is that agreed? It's agreed. In relation to Section 82, there is one amendment, uh, Amendment 37, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with Amendment 4. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed? That's agreed. The question then is that Section 82, as amended, stand part of the Bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. Section 83, there is one amendment, Amendment number 38, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with Amendment number 4. The question is that is Amendment 38 agreed? It's agreed. The question then is that section 83, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 84, is there, in relation to section 84, that section 84 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 85 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? It's agreed. In relation to section 30, it's 86, there are two amendments, amendment 39 and 40, both in the name of the minister. 39 and 40 are related and will be discussed together. Yeah, and just to alert the deputies, this is the one we were referring to earlier. In 2008, the HSE introduced a requirement that consultants be registered on the specialist division of the Medical Council Register. Consultants appointed prior to 2008 under the standard recruitment arrangements in place for the filling of consultant posts at the time did not have to be registered in this division. The Medical Practitioners Act 2007 included a provision allowing a five-year period in which the Council could grant registration to any medical practitioner who, being able to be registered in the general division, satisfied the Council that he or she had obtained sufficient training and experience such as he or she should be registered as a specialist in that list. A small number of consultants appointed prior prior to 2008 did not avail themselves of this provision. They are unable to apply for registration on the specialist division because they do not have the specified qualifications for specialist registration. This relates to a small number of consultants, approximately 30 to 40 chairman. The amendment would enable the Medical Council to register in the specialist division a medical practitioner who is currently registered in the general division and who satisfies the Council that he or she has obtained sufficient training and expertise such that he or she should be registered as a specialist. This window of registration will be available for one year from the commencement of the relevant section of the Bill. The amendment also provides that within this time frame and for the purposes of the above provision, the Medical Council will work with specialist training bodies to assist medical practitioners registered in the general division to achieve the necessary standard for registration in the specialist uh, division. Thank you, Minister. Deputy Donnelly. Uh, thanks, thanks, Minister. Minister. I, I won't... Um, repeat what I was saying earlier on. Obviously, it's a it, it's a serious issue. Could you just repeat, Minister, if you if you, if you wouldn't mind, there, there was a, a sentence you you gave, which was that they do not have the 
what? Could you just repeat? Okay. They do not have the specified qualifications for specialist registration. The specified qualifications for specialist registration. They do not have the specified qualifications. So the concern, obviously, is that if they don't have the, spe the, 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 the specified qualifications, why would we be creating an opportunity for them to be registered as consultants? Can they not just, why is it not the case that the position is you, you don't have the specified qualifications, get them, we'll support you in getting them, but, and when you get them, you can go through the same procedure as everybody else. Why are we creating an exception for these, this group? Because the qualification in the group. Yeah, like they were correctly appointed as consultants, but they missed the window uh, that was there for them to register at that time. Okay, that's the qualification. They have the necessary experience, as I said in my piece there, and they have the necessary training. Uh, but there's a, there's a, I suppose, is it, it's more than technical, to be fair. It's a... Yeah. Um, maybe if you just give me a moment there and I can just read it. Like, Obviously, they have to satisfy the medical council, and there's no. Um, it is important to appreciate that these consultants are properly qualified. They hold their consultant posts, having met the eligibility criteria that applied to the posts when they were advertised and filled. These consultants acquired their posts, having been deemed eligible to compete for them when their applications were assessed. They did not acquire their posts through contracts of indef indefinite duration. The provision is also framed so as to ensure that the Council is satisfied that the consultant concerned has the necessary training and experience to merit inclusion on the specialist division. And does that answer your... Uh, no, it, okay. it, it, I'm, 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 I'm more confused now. Um, you've, the, you've said that they don't have, they do not have the specified qualifications but then I think you said they, they do have the specified qualifications and training and experience. So, can, which, which, which is it? Okay. They don't have the specialist qualifications that are required for the specialist division, but they were properly. It's complicated, there's a, and I know the seriousness of it as well, and, and I appreciate the deputy, and I've heard the deputy speak on this issue many times. The, the specialist register has, you know, a, an added layer of qualifications necessary. They have qualifications to act as a, or not to act, but to work as a consultant, and they have the necessary training and experience, but they need some, they need to work with the medical council just to get this additional layer of qualification. They are qualified to work as a consultant, but they need an additional layer to be on the specialist register, and this is to give them an opportunity to get that additional layer. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose it's the difference between the qualification and the training and experience of somebody in that field as well. And this is to allow them to work with the medical council, as I said, to, to achieve what is, you know, the very higher layer on the specialist register. They still are. Um, this isn't giving anybody a, a short cut or a pass or a, a, I was say a hospital pass, that would be. But it's not giving anybody the, you know, the, the um, giving anybody break. It's just allowing them to reach that, that higher level that has been set while they have the qualification and to recognise the training and experience and ensure they have that. Well, then there can be a bit of additional. Um, can I just ask a quick question there? So it's, this is the difference between qualification and experience and training. So recognition of experiential learning, obviously that, that's, that's covered by the qualifications um, quality in, uh, act and all that. So are you saying that these are people, if we can identify the cohort of people to be captured by this, are you talking about people who have an eligibility, not by virtue of their experience, but by virtue of their qualification, but did not apply to be admitted to the register at the time? Or are you talking about people who the Medical Council will have a role in reviewing their experiential learning and or other forms of training that they may have undertaken um, in the course of their duties, and that they will deem that to be equivalent to a qualification? 
because the, the issue here is one around whether or not a person is not just capable but also qualified. So to, to, you're, you're seeking to make a change to whether or not a person can be admitted onto the specialist register, and this is a, an area I have a particular interest in, and it's one I've raised on uh, uh, countless occasions on the basis that it is, uh, you know, you're saying these aren't people who will get their, um, who will get onto the register by virtue of, uh, or will get, will practice as a consultant by virtue of their legal entitlement to a contract of indefinite duration. Um, but I, I, might, I, will, I might be reading this wrong, but my read of this is, they actually could. So there's nothing that prohibits someone with. So if you are a person who doesn't have the necessary qualification, you are currently, as it, as it stands, working as a consultant and being paid as a consultant without being admitted to the specialist register, without having the necessary qualifications to be admitted to the specialist register. If this amendment is accepted, by virtue of the experience, some of which could be obtained under a contract of indefinite duration, because that's not specified here at all. So by virtue of their experience, could they then amass sufficient experiential learning on the job training that wouldn't necessarily be qualifications, but would give them that? And so therefore they will, they will then be allowed to be admitted to the register. But I don't see how this excludes someone who is uh, acting as a consultant, being paid as a consultant, and now entitled to a permanent position as a consultant by virtue of a contract of indefinite duration. And, and I'm, I could be missing that. So if the, if the person who is getting their uh, wages as a consultant by virtue of their contract of indefinite duration and not by virtue of their qualifications, how is that person excluded from being admitted to the specialist register? Uh, uh, I suppose by way back on the specialist register was brought in in 2008 mm -hmm. and there is a cohort of consultants uh, as I said about 30 or 40 this isn't reducing the standards in any way shape or form or make it easier for anybody existing but there was a cohort of consultants as I said in the region of 30 to 40 who did not um, qualify during that period for the specialist register or did not were not eligible I suppose is it yeah that they missed the window for the specialist register for the yes. specialist register sorry. which was sorry, sorry. sorry were they not eligible sorry, yeah. sorry to cut across it that this is relevant because at the start the understanding was they just didn't apply they could have but what you're saying is they weren't eligible could you just could we just get clarity on which it is because I think that matters And apologies if I'm not being uh, coherent and clear enough on this, because I, I get the importance of it, obviously. But uh, as I'm trying to understand it here, that there was a, there was a five-year window opened for consultants to get on the specialist register who were in place, who were qualified, who were appropriately, you know, trained, experienced, yeah. etc. There's no question there of any of that. Uh, they didn't avail of that uh, period in that five years. It wasn't that they weren't eligible, but they just didn't avail of it within the five-year period. And what we're essentially looking here to do is to open that window again, you know, and this was at the time when the specialist register was introduced um, under the Health, or the Act of 2007, was it the Health Care Act? Or to, to the, the Medical Practitioners Act 2007, which was establishing the, the uh, specialist register and there was a five-year window. There was 30 to 40 consultants in post in, still in post, who didn't avail of that window and have continued in post and are not on the specialist register, and this allows them an opportunity to effectively apply to be on the specialist register. It doesn't reduce the, the, the requirements that they have to meet, which is the concern of the, of the deputy, deputy's opposite. It, no way, it doesn't diminish in any way, shape or form the, the necessary training experience and qualification. It just gives them an opportunity to apply to be on the specialist register. So we're reopening the window that was put in legislation that was opened and closed within a five-year period, and they didn't avail of that during that period. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Minister. Can I ask then, because that, that seems reasonable, if that's all it is, but, but 
I, I think that may be contrary to certainly my understanding of what was said initially. So I think what I heard initially was that this group do not have the requisite qualifications. The, the explanation you've given it just now, I can support, mm -hmm. which is they didn't bother, they forgot, they were busy saving lives, and had they applied in that five-year window, they would have gone on to the specialist register like everybody else. And they didn't, and now we're trying to clean that up for good reasons. If that's the rationale, I, I can support that. But what I heard was they don't ha they're not on it because they don't have the requisite qualifications. So could, could, is, is, was that maybe just incorrect? Uh, no, as it happens, it wasn't correct, and I appreciate the last contribution I made. It was more helpful than some of the previous contributions to acknowledge that. But like, the issue was, during that, the reason there was a five-year window there, because there was a chance you may have required an additional, you know, a layer of something or other, vis-a-vis -vis qualification or whatever, you know, to be on the specialist register. So there was a five-year window there to do that, if, you know. So there is an element of both to it. They may require these people. They're, they're perfectly qualified, trained, experienced, all the rest. But to get on the specialist register, there's another layer of whatever you may need to do a course in. I don't want to put in the next word because I don't know. I, I'm not a medical person myself. But they may need some additional layer that they're perfectly capable of and entitled to and, and all of that. But they may, may need to just undergo that, as any of us do, um, you know, with yes. continuous professional development and whatever, and the standards have risen all the time. They may have been eligible at the time, and the goalposts have changed now, and they wouldn't be eligible because it has increased since that time, and they may need to fill that gap. And, Minister, will the same bar be applied to this 30 or 40 who are left, as was applied during the, during the five-year period? Uh, I think the bar has probably gone higher since. Higher. I would imagine okay. that the bar has gone higher since, and that they would have to, you know, like if they're, if they're applying today, we're just opening the window to allow them to apply. It won't be lower. Previous window, it certainly won't be lower. Okay, it certainly well, won't be lower. I'm okay with that then. Thank you. Deputy yeah, Riley. I, 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 I don't think that we're referring here to people who couldn't be bothered. I think there are possibly people who were on maternity leave, uh, were on sick leave, or who were, just weren't in a position to, uh, to do it at the time. And <coughs> they were given the, the, the five years to get whatever qualifications that they would have and, and to, to, to move themselves over and they, they didn't in that time. Okay, so are you certain that we are only talking about that 40 to 40 group? Because it does seem a little bit broader and that people who are not necessarily in that group. So we're literally talking about people who could have and who for whatever reason, um, you know, maybe they were on maternity leave, maybe they were on sick leave, maybe they were studying abroad. There could be a million reasons, right? But for whatever reason, they chose not to um, apply to be a member of the specialist register. They now, so it's only that group that it's limited. So there's nobody who would fall outside the scope of that group who would be able to benefit by by this. And if you, if, um, Minister, I'm I'm happy to to, uh, to 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 take your word on that. Obviously, if if you can, but but my read of it is this is open ended enough that people could benefit who are not in that 30 to 40. Uh, small little group. We're literally talking about people who, in the, the intervening period between 08 and 2013, would have had an opportunity to go onto the specialist register but haven't. But I, my read of this now is that, that people who are not in that very tight little group could benefit by this and, and could get themselves onto the specialist register. That being the case, I couldn't support it. But if it is the case that you're confident that this is only ring fence to that very tight little uh, little group, then. Um, well, well, obviously, um, and I know the deputy isn't suggesting that we're legislating for 30 or 40 individuals, no, and, no, and no. I know you're not suggesting that, but I just said maybe for people yeah. listening outside, just like that. Um, but it is a change that will impact on, you know, there's 30 or 40 people that are already doing the job in place. There is a larger cohort of consultants out there at the moment that are not on the specialist register that may be acting up as consultants, and this does not um, facilitate them in any way to move up here or whatever. This is, is designed around 30 or 40 that have the necessary experience, training and qualification. But for a, a, a bureaucratic or whatever word you want to say, reason, didn't get to be on the, the uh, specialist register at the time, but are perfectly entitled to be on it, provided that you know they may have to work with a medical council, as I said, on some level, but provided they do that, they're perfectly entitled on every other way. And this is the medical council will continue. Yeah. To you know, to have that standard there, there is. This is not legislation to diminish the standards of consultants in, in in this country in any way, shape, or form. This is just. We all know where anomalies occur when legislation yeah. changes. 
conditions and can impact on negatively on one cohort and massively positively on another. Yeah. So this is a fairness measure to allow those people to have the same right to access the specialist register or become on the register, special register as their colleagues have that they've been working alongside. Okay, and I, and I, I fully appreciate that and I think that is actually fair and I think it does balance things. Um, but I, I just would have a concern that if I was a person who wasn't in that scenario, but is now in that scenario, I would say by virtue of my experience, because the, the, the nature of healthcare delivery uh, and the recruitment crisis being what it is, people who wouldn't be eligible to be on the specialist register are now acting as consultants. So would I not be able to claim under, under this section of the Act, would I not be able to claim an entitlement to entry to the specialist register by virtue of my experiential learning, training and anything that doesn't necessarily amount to a qualification? So could I not do what this 30 to 40 group uh, could do, potentially do, which is go to the medical council and say, well, I want recognition for, because like, these people are acting as consultants, so they're, they're, all of their experience um, since they, they took up the acting post, whether they're, they're on a CID or not, they're still acting. So would I not be entitled to the benefit of the act? Would it not be unfair if, if this goes through as is? Would it not be deemed by me as a person uh, who falls outside of that, would I not look to, to the other person beside me and say, well, no, that's not fair. I, I want the benefit of that legislation as well and, and seek to go to the Medical Council. Yeah. And that, that would be my primary concern in this regard. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, look, can I just reiterate, absolutely, we categorically, we are not changing the standards in any way, shape, form, or the standards that need to be required, you know, for somebody to get on the specialist register. All we're doing is a cohort of people who have achieved that standards, but for a, a bureaucracy as opposed to a standard or a right. training or an experience deficit, we're not able to get on it. And that was uh, in legislation that put a time period on it, a five-year time period and they were locked up because they didn't get within that five-year time period. So this is to give them that opportunity to, to attain. They still have to attain the same standards and the same all of that. There is no question that anything we're doing in this room is going to lessen or allow, as you said yourself, for anybody else to go in and, and get That's, in the window. Yeah. There is absolutely no, no, no um, certainty there. But look, I appreciate the concern of the, of the members opposite, yeah. and I'm quite happy to get you a better, more extensive briefing on that particular aspect That's what and I get it to circulated ask. to you so that yeah. you have a better look at this between now and report stage because yeah. I don't want anybody to have a concern. And I certainly want to assure the people that will be watching this or, or you know, following this as well that there is absolutely no change under this legislation right. to the standards of the healthcare, um, you know, Yeah, no, no, and, and I, I, and I hear what you could, could, could that explanatory note take the form of uh, confirmation as to how this, this group is included? Impact. But it, it specifically and explicitly excludes that that group, the CID group, or whatever we want, whatever words we want. To, if, if that could, um, if they could take that form, I think that would be very, very helpful. Be uh, of course, you. absolutely, deputy, happy to do so. And just for clarification, minister, once the first anniversary of the commencement of this section is uh, comes into play, does that mean that a medical practitioner cannot get on the specialist? register unless they have the specialist qualifications by examination or by assessment by their professional bodies that they cannot be, go on the specialist register and therefore cannot be appointed as consultants. Can you still be appointed as a consultant without being on the special re, specialist register after this one year commencement? So the answer to the first part is yes, okay, like that you can get on the specialist register but the appointment of a consultant is... Uh, I don't know whether that practice will be changed by this particular piece of this amendment to legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I'm not certain of that because I know there was a judgment uh, in the courts and that and that wasn't there. So, I, look, I, I'll get that provided for you, um, Chairman, as well, if that's okay as part of the, the briefing, because that would involve the existing legislation as well. I would have to review that to see where you know what that points to. Um, this wouldn't change it. Uh, this particular amendment wouldn't change it, but I have to get just look at the other regis legislation to give you the overall picture of your question, which is into the future, uh, how stands people who are uh, acting as consultants but not on the specialist register? I think that's essentially your query. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the question then is in relation to Amendment 39 of Section 86, uh, that that amendment be agreed? Agreed. 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 And that Amendment 40 uh, in relation to Section 86, that that amendment be agreed? Subject to the clarifications, we'll get you. Section, the, the question is in that Section 86 as amended stand part of the Bill. 
Uh, just to remind members, we, we have a second session in relation to Brexit, so will we continue to examine this piece of legislation? Are you happy to continue? Uh, there are um, 14 amendments left. The next session is at 12, Chair. So 11. 11. Oh, 11. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Will we proceed? <laughs> we proceed for okay. Nine and ten done anyway. Section I'm happy to oblige. I'd like to show the deputy. That's uh, that section eighty seven. The question is that section eighty seven stand part of the bill. Agreed. Agreed. That section eighty eight stand part of the agreed. bill. Is that agreed? agreed. Section eighty nine stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. Section ninety stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That section ninety one stand part of the bill. Agreed. Is that agreed? That section ninety two stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 93 stand part of the bill, agreed. is that agreed? agreed? That section 94 stand part of the bill, is agreed. that agreed? In relation to section 95, there's one amendment, uh, amendment 41 in the name of the minister. It's a new section already discussed with amendment 36. Acceptance of, the, uh, acceptance of this amendment involves the deletion of section 95 of the bill. Minister. That's agreed, yeah, that's just a consequence of, uh, of the previous amendment. So agreed. Proposed as is. So that Amendment 41 be agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, the question then is that Section 95 be deleted agreed. from the bill. It's agreed. agreed. That Section 96 stand part of the bill? Agreed. Section 97 stand part of the bill? Agreed. Section 98 stand part of the bill? Agreed. agreed. That Section 99 stand part of the bill? Agreed. agreed. Section 100 stand part of the bill? Agreed. That Section 101 stand part of the bill? Agreed. agreed. Section 102 stand part of the bill. It's agreed. Section 103 stand part of the bill. It's agreed. Sorry. Yes. Um, Minister, on section 103, the, um, the IMO had concerns. They were wondering if it made sense for proceedings to be held in camera uh, un until um, adverse findings were were made, at which point the whole thing would be made uh, made public. I'm in, I'm in two minds about it. We want as much transparency as possible. I think their concern is that um, for practitioners who might have vexatious um, or well-intentioned but just, you know, non-substantiated um, allegations made, that the proceeding itself um, could cause a lot of damage um, and when the, the, the finding is not or no finding is made against the practitioner that that damage potentially remains because of the public nature of the hearings I'm also cognizant of the fact that court cases are in public regardless of what the findings are and by exceptional circumstance are held in camera for children and, and family law and, 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 and so forth I just would like your view on the, um, the concerns raised by the representative body, if I may. Yeah, I, I suppose one of the basic principles underpinning the justice system is that justice should not only be done but be seen to be done, you know, and we can debate that principle here in this forum or any other forum, but that is the accepted principle on which we based uh, this. So, like, if we think it should be in camera, look, there, there's, of course there's concerns. Um, you know, we, we've accepted those concerns or the judicial system has in childcare cases where they're held in camera and, you know, there are exceptions where it, where it isn't. Um, there isn't any amendment that I can address or speak to. Um, I Like under the Act as it is existing already, uh, and there isn't a proposal to change that under the medical or under the um, what like the Medical Practitioners Act, uh, it is that they are held in camera. So that's what's there. Sorry, in public. In public. public. Sorry, in public. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. Um, 
that are held in public. That's the existing norm, and there isn't a proposal here to change that. If what this particular amendment does propose to do is that the practice committee, the fitness to practice committee, may order that certain information regarding hearing uh, should not be published. So, I mean, it, it's introducing a degree of latitude to the pre-existing legislation uh, and allowing for the situations where the fitness practice committee can decide that that's not in the public interest. So, I think that's it, it. Actually, is addressing your concern. I think if I'm yeah, I think so. Thank you. Okay. okay the, section, the question then is that section 103, 103 stands part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That section 104 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That section 105 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 106 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 107 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 108 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 109 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 110 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That section 111 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 112 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 113 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 114 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 115 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 116 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? In relation to section 117, there is one amendment, amendment number 42, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with 13. The question is that amendment 42 stand, uh, uh, amendment 42 be agreed? Agreed. Dear O'Reilly, you are opposing section 117. On the, on the same basis as, uh, as previously in relation to publication, we've already, we've already uh, discussed that, so I am opposing it. So the question is that section 117, as amended, be agreed. And those in favour say to. Oh. to. Those against say Neil. Neil. Uh, I think the question is carried. The question then is that section 117, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. Section 118, stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That section 119, stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That section, sorry, in the relation to section 120, there is one amendment, amendment 43, in, in the name of the Minister, insertion of a new section that, uh, so Minister. Thank you. Uh, uh, the doctors are obliged to maintain their professional competence by following the requirements set by the Medical Council and by enrolling in professional competence schemes. Section 91 of the Medical Practitioners Act places a duty on the Medical Council to satisfy itself as to the ongoing maintenance of doctors' professional competence. Section 91.7 of the Act provides an explicit power for the Council to make a complaint to the Preliminary Proceedings Committee where a doctor in the Specialist Division or the Trainee Specialist Division fails despite being given an opportunity to meet the standard of competence that can be expected of them. The proposed amendment extends this power of the Council to also include doctors registered on two other registers, the General Division and the Supervised Division. This amendment will ensure that the Medical Council's powers of complaint in relation to professional companies apply to all relevant categories of doctor and will enhance patient safety. Margaret. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question is that Amendment 43 be agreed? Agreed. Section, the question then is that Section 120 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That's agreed. That Section 120 one stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. Section 122 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. In relation to section 123, there is one amendment in the name of the Minister, amendment number 44, already discussed with four. The question is that amendment 44 be agreed? Agreed. The question then is that section 123, as amended, stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 124 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That's, uh, in relation to section 125, there's one amendment, amendment 45, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with 16. The question is that amendment 45 be agreed? Agreed. And then the question is that section 125 as amended stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. Section 126 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? agreed. That section 120, sorry, sec, in relation to section 127, there are two amendments. Um, one, amendment 46 in the name of the Minister, and 47 in the name of Deputy Louisa Riley. Amendment 46 has already been discussed with amendment 4. The question is that amendment 46 be agreed? That's agreed. agreed. Is that agreed? Thank you. And in relation to 47, already discussed with 
23. Is the amendment being pressed, Deputy O'Reilly? Um, it is, and I don't recall that we had considered this previously. Uh, already discussed for 23. I think it's the next one. Oh, you also have to be up, I said, Deputy Riley, next part tonight. 47, yeah. Uh, 40. I don't, I, ha I, I have a note on 47, and I don't, I haven't scribbled all over it, which means I haven't gone to it yet. What does it relate to? <laughs> it relates to uh, a fitness to practice committee making a finding against a, a Norse, if there's not a Norse on the committee, and oh, maybe I've done That's 49, uh, that's, that's amendment 49. Oh, my apologies. Sure, it is. Okay. Sorry that I have 47. Chair. So, are you, are, you, are you pressing Amendment 47? Uh, no, Chair. No. No, I will okay. move and withdraw. Yeah. So, the question then is that uh, Section 27, 127, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Section 128, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That section, in relation to Section 129, there are two amendments, Amendment 48 in the name of the Minister and Amendment 49 in the name of Deputy Louise O'Reilly. If question 48 is agreed, 49 cannot be moved. 48 and 49 are related. 49 is a physical alternative to 48 and 48 and a 9 and 49 will be discussed together. So Amendment 48 in your name, Minister. Thank you, Governor Margaret. Again, at present, both a nurse and a midwife are required to sit in the preliminary proceedings committee of PPC and a fitness to practice committee of the Nursing and Midwifery Board. The requirement to have both on a PPC has caused operational problems for the regulator and, in some cases, has lengthened the time it takes for an inquiry to conclude. Section 129 of the Bill removes this requirement. Since the Bill was published, concerns were raised that Section 129, as drafted, might have unintended consequences in relation to the composition of committees. Specifically, these concerns were that neither a nurse nor a midwife might be required to sit on a committee and that a nurse might not sit on a committee inquiring into a nurse and a midwife for a midwife. Following further consideration and discussion with the regulator and the OPC, it is agreed that these concerns would be addressed by the removal of paragraph 11AA in Part C of Section 129 of the Bill, and this amendment has been drafted accordingly. When applied to the Bill and the existing Act, the net effect of Amendment 48 is that there will be no change to the PPC, i.e. there will continue to be at least one nurse and one midwife on a preliminary proceedings committee and any subcommittee. And secondly, there will, be, there will be a change to the FTP, the Fitness to Practice Committee, for inquiries beginning after the section comes into effect, there will be at least one nurse or one midwife on a Fitness to Practice Committee or subcommittee, and where a nurse is being inquired into, a nurse must be on the committee and likewise for a midwife. This amendment also introduces another key feature which will assist the NMBI to process complaints more quickly. The bill as drafted provides that the new streamlined committee structures will apply only to inquiries into complaints made after this section of the bill comes into effect. However, Amendment 48 provides that the new provisions related to fitness to practice composition will apply to complaints currently being examined but which have not yet reached the fitness to practice hearing stage, and that is the inclusion of a, of a nurse or midwife, just to be clear, as well as to these complaints which are made after the section comes into effect. These hearings are held towards the end of the inquiry, and this amendment will therefore allow a large batch of complaints currently in the early and middle stages of investigation to be heard by the streamlined committee structure. Concluding these hearings as quickly as possible is in the interest of both the registrant and the complainant. Uh, yeah, no, it absolutely is. Yes, yeah. uh, okay, so uh, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, what my, you, you can see what's in my, what my concern is that a nurse will be adjudicating on a, mm -hmm. a case of a midwife and, and vice versa. Yeah. Are you saying that that won't happen now? Yeah. Okay. I'm, 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 I think that's, that's, clear, that's clear. That's clear. Uh, yeah, no, no, and, and it was in, in the in the absence of uh, of, of something to you know. Well, to we accept that. it was a very fair point for concerns, and yeah. uh, and, the, the and it's incorporated proposed, into your the, amendment. That's, that's right. The amendment is proposed to address that concern, which we absolutely accept. So the question then is that amendment forty eight in the name of the minister be agreed. 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 In that case, then um, amendment forty nine cannot be moved. The question then is that section 129 as amended stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 130 uh, stand part of the bill, is that agreed? That's agreed. That section 131 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. That section 132 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to section 133, there is one amendment in relation, amendment 50, in the name of the minister, already discussed with amendment 4. The question is that that amendment be agreed? Agreed. 
The question then is that section 133 is amended to stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 134 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed? That section 135 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 136 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 137 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 138 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 139 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 140 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 141 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That in relation to section 142, there is one amendment, amendment 51, in the name of the minister, already discussed with amendment 4. The question is that amendment 51 be agreed. agreed. The question then is that section 142 is amended stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That section 143 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 144 stand part of the bill. <coughs> is that agreed? agreed. That section 145 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 146 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 107, 147 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 148 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 149 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 150 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 151 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 152 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That section 153 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? That section 154 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? In relation to section 155, the section is being opposed by Deputy O'Reilly. Yes, um, Chair, if I could just briefly speak to this. Um, section 155 proposes to amend section 72, which requires that sanctions of advice or admonishment or censure are confirmed by a court. Um, currently, that's not the case. Okay, so um, there is a particular circumstance which was brought to my attention. It's not one I have a personal experience of, but there is a facility within the Nurses and Midwives Act for registrants to seek that hearings take place other than in public, and this can be granted uh, by the Fitness to Practice Committee. And when it is granted, it predominantly involves cases um, where there is a relevant medical disability. And the purpose of um, my opposition arises from the fact that if that has to go to court, well then, if there is misconduct which may arise out of a uh, disability, most likely a, 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 mental, a mental health issue, uh, that that will then form part of the admonishment or the censure and that is then read out in open court so that you might take a compassionate view of what, what is an issue around professional conduct or misconduct or, or poor professional uh, practice. But that in having to go however low the, the, the sanction might be, in having to confirm that in the court so the, the, the Fitness to Practice Committee may exercise their discretion to hold back information from, from, the, from the general public out of concern for the person's mental health, which they do at the moment. But that facility is then gone from them because elements of the disability may find itself into the public domain by virtue of the uh, admonishment, which will then be confirmed by the court in, uh, in, open, in open court and go on the public record. It's a fairly specific uh, concern. It's one where the discretion is allowed for at the moment in the, in the Nurses and Midwives Act, and this is, this is going to change that. And uh, the, the information I have is that that change um, will not, you know, may have unintended consequences. Okay. I, I suppose where we would envisage that is again the, co the court having discretion to hold it in camera as opposed to hold it in public if there was a concern uh, at that stage. And obviously make the direction which we discussed earlier about publication as well. Mm -hmm. But that they would have the, also the discretion whether to hold in camera, which is your concern. I think yeah. that once it goes into the court, that it goes into the public domain. But the court would still have the, the, the opportunity to hold it in camera if deemed appropriate. Okay. I'm sorry now. I, I don't want to be glib. But, but in realistic terms, how likely do you think that is? And as a general rule, I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a legal person, but my understanding is the vast, vast, vast majority of uh, court decisions are, are published. And this, th the unintended consequence here would have very serious implications, albeit for a very small, discrete number of people, but it still would have very, very serious implications for, those, for that group. I can't uh, second guess what the courts will do, and I know you're not asking me directly to that, but uh, to say how likely will it happen. But uh, you know, the regulator, there are existing 
situations where the regulator can actually ask for it to be held in camera and to be at the discretion of the regulator, which you know, is what you were referring to, having the Fitness Practice Committee having that discretion uh, while they don't make the decision. They would ask the courts and we would anticipate that the courts would, would adjudicate fairly on that request. Uh, in the interest of, uh, like the courts would make the call on balancing the public interest versus the interest of, of the person mm -hmm. uh, who wishes to have the information, but just the regulator would apply on their behalf and ask the courts to do it in camera if they had a concern or if yeah. they had a, you know. But Minister, if you just put yourself in the shoes of that individual while they wait for the, the High Court to sit to, to, to make that adjudication, that person, you know, that, that person is going to be, if they, they already you know, have a disability that may have been material to uh, the, the, the misconduct, you've then that added stress and pressure on top of them while they wait to see if the, uh, if the High Court is going to publish. I, I just think the, the, the facility that exists at the moment whereby uh, the, it, do, it doesn't go any further than the committee, it doesn't have to go to the court. I think that the, the confirmatory nature of having to go to the court, I, I, I believe, is unduly burdensome. We've had, we've had this discussion out, I know, and I'm, I'm conscious that we have another session. I'm not going to labour the point, but, uh, Chair, I, I do want to record that I am opposed to, to Section okay. 155. Okay. So the question is that Section 155 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Not agreed. Not agreed. Uh, those in favour uh, say ta. Ta. Those against say nil. Nil. I think the question is carried. The next question then is that Section 156 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. That Section 157 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. That Section 158 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? agreed. At section 159 stand part of the bill is that agreed in relation to section 160 there are there's one amendment amendment 52 in the name of the minister already discussed with 13 the question is that that amendment be agreed agreed deputy o'reilly uh, you are opposing i am section opposing 160. that and chair i have outlined my reasons I, I don't propose to go over them again but i, I am opposing section 160. The question is then that section 160 as amended stand part of the, the bill. Agreed. Not agreed. Those in favour say ta. Ta. Those against? Neil. Uh, I believe that the question is carried. In relation to 100, section 161, that 161 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? agreed. That section 162 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? agreed? That section 163 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to section 164, there's one amendment, amendment 53, in the name of the minister, already discussed with amendment 4. The question is, is that amendment agreed? Agreed. The question then is that section 164, as amended, stand part of the bill. Agreed. That section 165 stand part of the bill? Agreed. In relation to one, section 166, there is one amendment, Amendment 54, in the name of the Minister, already discussed with Amendment 16. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed? Agreed. agreed. The question then is that section 166, as amended, stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. Section 167, uh, that section 167 stand part of the bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. In relation to section 168, there is one amendment, Amendment 55, in the name of the Minister. It's, it's the insertion of a new section. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. I move Amendment number 55 to professional qualifications. The Directive requires each Member State to designate a competent authority for a profession regulated for the purposes of the Directive. The amendment gives the Minister for Health the power to designate the HSE as a competent authority to compare the equivalence of non-Irish qualifications to the qualification it sets for certain health professions, which are not regulated on a statutory basis, but which are regulated for the purposes of the EU Professional Qualifications Directive. Currently, the Minister is a competent authority for these professions. The amendment being moved allows the Minister by order to designate the HSE as a competent authority for those professions for which it sets the qualifications required for the pursuit of that profession in the publicly funded health sector and which will not be subject to statutory regulation by CORU. The professions which currently come within the scope of the directive are those of audiologist and environmental health officer. Thank you. Minister. Uh, the question is then that Amendment 55 be agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. That Section 168 then as amended be agreed? Uh, be, thank you. Or at stand part of the bill, sorry. Agreed? Agreed. And finally, section 169. That section 169 stand part of the bill, is that agreed? Agreed. 
Thank you. This be the title of the bill. An Act to give further effect to Directive 2055-36-EC of the European Parliament and of the Council of the 7th of September 2005 on the recognition of professional qualifications as amended by Council Directive 2006-100-EC of the 20th of November 2006 Commission Regulation EC number 1430-2007 of, of the 5th of December 2007. Commission Regulation EC number 755-2008 of the 31st of July 2008. Regulation EC number 1137-2008 of the European Parliament and of the Council of the 22nd of October 2008. Commission Regulation EC number 279-2009 of the 6th of April 2009. Commission Regulation EC number 213-2011 of the 3rd of March 2011. Act concerning the accession of the Republic of Croatia. Commission Regulation EC number 623-2012 of the 11th of July 2012. Council Directive 2013-25-EU of the 13th of May 2013. Directive 2013-55-EU of the European Parliament and of the Council of the 20th of November 2013 and Commission Delegated Decision EC 2016-790 of the 13th of January 2016, and for that purpose to amend the Dentist Act of 1985, the Health and Social Care Professional Act of 2005, the Pharmacy Act of 2007, the Medical Practitioners Act of 2007, and the Nurses and Midwives Act of 2011 to make provision for certain other amendments to those acts, to make provision for certain amendments of the Health Act 1953, the Health Identifiers Act of 2014, and the Children and Family Relationship, Relationship Act 2015, and to provide for related matters. Ah. Is that agreed? <laughs> Sorry, Chair, could you just say that bit again? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay, yeah. Chair, can I just flag one without, without just bringing the whole uh, party to a complete end? Can I just flag just the intention, which is necessary, I believe, at this stage, that the Minister will, make, uh, will wish possibly to make a further amendment at report stage. Uh, the bill provides that a regulator shall advise its equivalent body in another jurisdiction where the regulator has reason to believe that the practitioner is registered as soon as practical after it has applied a sanction. The Minister may put down an amendment to specifically, specifically provide that a regulator may similarly advise its equipment body in another jurisdiction of the immediate suspension of a registrant prior to or during an inquiry where the regulator has reason to believe that the practitioner is registered. That's just a flag, that intention that okay. the Minister may, may do at, at the report stage. So, as, thank you, Minister, for that. As consideration of the bill has been completed in accordance with Standing Order 87, the following message will be sent to the Clerk of the Dáil. The Select Committee on Health has completed its consideration of the Regulated Professions Health and Social Care Amendment Bill 2019 and has made amendments to that bill. Is that agreed? Agreed. I'd like to thank the Minister uh, and your officials, Minister, for coming in this morning and giving consideration of the bill. The committee, this Select Committee is now adjourned. Sin D.A.